number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, March 31st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 11 degrees, 12 degrees in Smith Falls, and here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Some trial data on the Pfizer vaccine shows that shot is highly effective in younger teens. We get more from City News reporter Kevin Meisner. These study findings suggest that the Pfizer vaccine offers absolute protection for children in the age group of 12 to 15. Now, the company uh, issuing a statement saying that not a single volunteer who was given their shot became infected with COVID-19 and all developed strong antibody response. Now, this news could accelerate vaccination campaigns for children, especially over the summer months, ahead of the return for the new school year. I'm Kevin Meisner. Now, the Ontario Medical Association will be releasing some research it did today detailing exactly who is spreading misinformation about COVID-19, its vaccines, and why. The OMA says it will release exclusive new research which it, it says contains some surprises about the age group most active in these discussions. Association members will also talk about the province's doctors and how they've been combating COVID misinformation. This media briefing is scheduled for 1 o'clock this afternoon. The website of the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, is showing the coronavirus vaccine from AstraZeneca has changed its name to Vaxzevria. The portal of the Swedish National Medicine Agency confirms a name change was approved by the EMA last Thursday following a request from the company. City News Time 9.01 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. A gusty wind out of the southwest and then more of a northwest wind. Falling temperatures today with the periods of light rain 14 early this morning will drop to minus one for the low. It'll feel colder with the wind. That rain will change to snow tonight and some snow tomorrow morning. A couple of centimeters possible the high near one. For today already reached the high 14. And right now we're in Ottawa, 11 degrees. In Smith Falls, right now it's 12. City News Time, 9.02. The Udaway, among five regions in Quebec to see a concerning spike in COVID-19 cases recently. With that, the provinces of Quebec and Ontario are in talks now to harmonize restrictions in Ottawa, Gatineau, make them all one area as far as restrictions are concerned. Here's City News reporter Alex Gouge. Premier Francois Legault says additional restrictions can be implemented if needed, but Ontario's situation has to be accounted for before doing so. While speaking to the media, he explains why Quebec is in a different position with COVID-19 than Ontario. Our measures are tougher, including the curfew at 9.30. Uh, all the uh, restaurants for 60% of Quebec in red zones are closed. The Premier attributes the rising cases in the five regions to people not following COVID rules and guidelines, especially with home visitors. He anticipates those areas will see an increase in hospitalizations in the coming weeks, but doesn't expect that to exceed capacity. Alex Gouge, City News. City News Time, 903. Ontario Premier Doug Ford warning people don't make plans for Easter weekend. He's considering added restrictions with the province posting more than 2,000 cases of COVID-19 now for six straight days. The latest figure is coming out in about an hour's time. BC is also under a three-week circuit breaker, they're calling it a lockdown. Saskatchewan has extended a lockdown in Regina. And as you heard, Quebec Premier Francois Legault says rising case numbers are a concern in five regions through Quebec. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. your opinion. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Take whatever you can get and don't go anywhere. We are more than a year into this pandemic and that's the best advice on offer. Take whatever you can get and don't go anywhere. Good morning, this is the Rob Snow Show on City News. Take whatever you can get and don't go anywhere. Take whatever you can get. Let's start there. Uh, will Canadians take whatever they can get? Based on the conversations that I had yesterday with my listeners, I'm not really sure if that's the case. 
The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, had some advice for Canadians yesterday when it comes to the country's faltering vaccination program, and it's take whatever you can get, okay? If it's Pfizer, take the Pfizer. If it's Moderna, take the Moderna, J&J, take it. Just take it, okay? And if it's AstraZeneca, if that's what they offer you when they call your name, when it's your term, just roll up your sleeves and be happy, I guess, that you're getting anything at all. Let's listen to the Prime Minister of Canada, roll tape. The bottom line for Canadians is the right vaccine for you to take is the very first vaccine that you are offered. The more we get Canadians vaccinated quickly and safely, the quicker we'll be able to get back to a semblance of normality. Uh, with the, the, the variants uh, that are uh, more severe and more transmissible uh, increasing around the population, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to get through this. Take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get. Okay, the science is evolving, but uh, will you take whatever you can get? Look, I know we talked about this yesterday, but I think we should get right back into it today. Hey, this is not a one-day wonder. Will you take whatever you can get, whatever's available, when they call your name? You know, picture it, okay? That day finally arrives, that wonderful day. It's your turn. You've waited more than a year. It's your turn to be vaccinated, and you will be offered at least some protection from this terrible virus that has upended so many lives. And you go to the local vaccination center and you, you just ask the person there out of curiosity, what shot am I getting? And the person says, AstraZeneca. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to take whatever you can get? I'm curious. I'm just curious. Because a lot of people told me yesterday, no, <laughs> I'm not taking whatever I can get. I will reschedule, is what I was told by some, not all, yesterday. I will rebook, some said. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll wait a little longer, they said. I'd rather wait than have that shot. I waited a year. I can wait another month. I waited a year, I can wait another two months. If it means I get one of the other vaccines instead of that vaccine. I've just heard too much that's bad, worrisome, troublesome about that vaccine. Are you one of those people? I'm not here to judge, I'm just curious. Or would you do what the prime minister says you should do? And just take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get. Now, look, I know, and it's good news. This is good news, okay? I know the Prime Minister said yesterday, uh, he, he, he clicked the fancy socks together, poof, Canada's getting an early shipment of 5 million Pfizer doses. Okay? <laughs> Amazing how he keeps doing that. And I, 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 it's good news. It's good news. And I, you know, I don't want to sound like a spoil sport or a party pooper. I'm not here to rain on anybody's parade. Okay. But I, I just, I just want to point out 5 million doses, big number, 5 million doses would last not even two days in the United States. 5 million doses is not even two days worth of supply. For the United States, the United States is vaccinating 2.7 million people every day. And it's getting close to 2.8 million people every day. We haven't even hit 200,000 a day. <laughs> it's in the news in California. The zoo in California, Oakland, California zoo, the zoo is going to begin vaccinating high-risk animals against COVID-19 in June. Most Canadians in their 80s will, will, will not even have had a second dose by the time the orangutans at the Oakland Zoo are fully immunized. Just saying. Take whatever you can get is what the Prime Minister says. Take whatever you can get. 
Is that what you're going to do? Share your opinion with me this morning here on the Rob Snow Show. We'll have expert opinion, should you take whatever you can get. Uh, but I always love hearing from you, your opinions. And we gather your opinions via the telephone and email every morning during the talk back hour between 10 and 11 o'clock here on City News. Call in line is 750-1310. 750-1310. 613-750-1310. You can drop me an email, the Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. Take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get. And then there's don't go anywhere. Right? And soon, let's face it, you might not have very many places to go anyway. By the sounds of things, all kinds of rumors floating around that Premier Ford is planning to announce another lockdown. And yesterday he was asked about the possibility of imposing another lockdown, and it's not like he denied it. It's not as though it hasn't crossed his mind. Let's listen to Ontario Premier Doug Ford. Roll tape. Yeah, everything's on the table right now. So, folks, be prepared. I'm asking you, don't make plans for Easter. That's what I can I can tell you. Uh, I, I won't hesitate uh, to to you know lock things down if we have to. I did it before. I'll do it again. Nothing's more important than than our health. I did it before. I'll do it again. Don't go anywhere. Don't make any plans. Yesterday, Doctor Tam said, remain isolated, remain isolated. Right. And Doug Ford said, don't go anywhere, don't make any plans for Easter. And on this issue, I feel as though we should get right back into this again today, the possibility of yet another lockdown. And I'm thinking back to the Christmas lockdown that came into effect on Boxing Day. Now we have this added twist as well, the idea that Ottawa and Gatineau could coordinate their restrictions. So, you know, maybe on the Ottawa side, it's not just lockdowns. Maybe you're dealing with a made-in-Ottawa curfew as well. I might want to ask you about that, okay? Illegal, right? Illegal to leave the house before 5 o'clock in the morning. Not allowed to be out in the house, well, depending on what region you're in, say, after 8 o'clock at night or after 9.30 at night. That's the way it works in Quebec. But who knows at this point if that's going to come to pass. But here's the thing, okay? We've had, I believe it's five days in a row now with the daily case counts more than 2,000 across Ontario. There are more cases now, and there are more patients in ICU now than there was when Premier Ford brought in the Boxing Day lockdown, province-wide. When that lockdown, you remember it was announced a few days before Christmas, and then it went into effect on Boxing Day, it was December 21st, I believe, there were 2,100 cases across Ontario when the Boxing Day lockdown was announced. Yesterday, there were more than 2,300. 2,100 just before the Boxing Day lockdown, 2,300 reported yesterday, new number in about an hour from now. And now there are more people in ICU and now they're younger on average. But, but on the other side, this is like the tug of war, the lockdown tug of war. On the other side, um, the big difference between then and now is vaccines. Take whatever you can get. And most people in long-term care, most people over the age of 90, most people over the age of 80, have had at least one dose of vaccine and long-term care fully vaccinated for the most part. And you see this reflected in the number of deaths being reported on a daily basis. That number has been declining in recent weeks. It's down about 13% in the last 14 days nationwide. So the case counts are up. The number of people in ICU, that's up. But the number of people actually dying from COVID-19 is falling.
because of vaccines. Now, if Doug Ford is going to announce anything about a lockdown, it would be a classic government move to announce the bad news the day before a long weekend. In other words, tomorrow. That's what they did with the Boxing Day lockdown. So if Doug Ford is going to break it to us tomorrow, what, what do you want Doug Ford to say tomorrow? Walk it down. Or no way. We're going to ride this out and speed up that vaccine program. So we're all over that today and a lot more on the COVID front. We'll also get the political fix from our strategists, two great ones today. Carl Belanger, Jason Leader, spring election off the table, politics of the carbon tax, lots to get into. Bruce McIntyre with Valley Views. Bruce is with the Eganville Leader and is doing some work for City News Ottawa. Tomorrow, 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 opening day for the Toronto Blue Jays. What can Jays fans expect this season? Get into that. Sue Shering from the Ottawa Sun on today's special meeting of the Transit Commission. Oh, yeah, it's a busy morning in the news game, and you have found the right place on the radio dial. The Rob Snow Show on City News. It's a space that needs to be lived in. It's a space that people... You know, have to have an experience of more than just art on the walls, I think. You know, yes, the art on the walls is fun, and it's fun to walk around and see all the beautiful things, and, and, and the way Dominic and Edith have curated the gallery is certainly uh, something worth seeing. But, uh, yeah, coming by and asking questions, again, to Dominic's point of view is, you know, interrupt him, ask questions. Uh, you know, I'm here on most of the days, too. We have Luce that comes in, Nancy that comes in. So, yeah, we have quite a few opportunities for people to come in and, you know, uh, see the process and, of course, ask a few questions. It's a great space. Uh, basically, the one event that we do do, or we did do, <laughs> is, the, um, is the jazz shows, the jazz and blues shows. And I think the weird thing to let you know is that the acoustics in here are really amazing. Uh, I think that was the first thing that blew me away when, when we started doing shows or when I was part uh, helping out with the shows. Um, and uh, the other part of the business, too, is we do rent it out for special occasions, too. So a few weddings, uh, birthday parties, uh, product launches, that kind of thing. So they're also a lot of fun. We do have one artist that's, that's from the States, but uh, yeah, not, of the 30-odd artists, uh, the rest are from either Quebec, Ontario, and one uh, beautiful woman from BC. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely part of the philosophy to, to maintain and uh, canvas and show uh, the beauty that we have in our backyard. You have the very, very strong personalities in, in Edith and Dominic, of course. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see how that actually balances out in the rest of the gallery. Um, without necessarily being, you know, um, an objective, uh, we basically have half female artists and half male artists in this gallery. Uh, but it, I can't say it's anything more than choosing the best people, you know, and that's just the way it is. And I love that. I think it, it's great. You know, we've, you go through here and you're like, wow, it's all pretty cool. And yep, you know, it's half for women and half for men. It's cool. Like everyone else, we didn't know what to think, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's overwhelming at first. You just know that things are closed. Um, and now you're trying to figure out what you do during that, that downtime, which I think everyone did. And I think it's a, in March, the, the, the first close, the, the first shutdown, uh, it was a lot of actually recuperating and resting and, 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 and not worrying too much on the spot. Um, you know, it's, uh, running a gallery is a bit like running a marathon with sprints. Um, so there comes a time where, yeah, it's actually nice to just take a break. Uh, and then you wake up and realize that, okay, now it's time to, uh, to wake up and deal with this new reality. From my perspective anyways, I, I, I think a gallery can be overwhelming and I like to make it fun. So you're going to come in, I'll ask you questions, I might even joke around with you. You know, the most people come here, they're not really going to buy art, but they could have a fun time and talk about it, right? Uh, and one of the things the gallery does offer is for, you know, for local um, purchases, we'll be happy to drive it to your house and hang it for you. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, so let's talk about the state of COVID-19 right now in the province of Ontario with Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. 
Uh, doctor, good morning. Infectious disease specialist, Trillium Health Partners, Mississauga. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be here. Yeah, it's nice to hear from you. How would you describe the, the current situation? Yeah, the current situation is, is currently one that's uh, put quite a bit of strain uh, on the uh, healthcare system, especially in the areas that I'm in. I'm in uh, the Peel region in Mississauga, but, but in the greater Toronto area. And yeah, we've, we've been seeing that the cases have certainly been increasing over the last uh, several days. But the big thing is, is the hospitals feeling the stretch as we're having, you know, our, our wards filling up and our ICUs as well. Okay. So do you think uh, just given the current trend, that if that stays in place, we are going to face another situation uh, where hospital administrators will be forced to delay other procedures for the sake of caring for COVID patients? It's certainly on the table. And one of the things that's important right now is that in the first wave, by this time, basically all surgeries were canceled. And, you know, we had a lot of hospital bed space, but we realized that we didn't need that much. So surgery is still going for a lot of the vital things, you know, cancer surgeries, heart surgeries, things that people still get with COVID. Right now, though, I think what's happening is that around the province, especially here, we're seeing a lot of hospitals redistributing the load. So patients being transported to other hospitals to kind of help to even things out a bit. So that's helping. But yes, I do think that surgeries in some places may need to be scaled back a bit for for a short period of time. Well, I remember the Ontario Hospital Association used to say 150 people in ICU across Ontario. That's all we can handle. And this morning there are 420 people in ICU with covid Absolutely. And, you know, the, the one thing to be fair is that in the first wave, one of the big differences is that pretty much everybody was on a ventilator back then. Yeah. Uh, we realized that as, as the waves went on that, look, we've learned a bit more. And now we realize that many patients can get a special type of nasal prong. It's called AirVo uh, that gives you a high amount of oxygen, doesn't require a ventilator. And that certainly does free up some resources there. Not trying to say that 400 is, any, is good or anything, but no, at no. least it has, we, we have been able to make some adjustments and get some treatments that make it so that it's not uh, as bad as it was before. Right. Medical professionals have learned a lot in the last year about how to treat a patient with COVID-19 is what I'm hearing, doctor. Is that right? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a, you know, a couple of new treatments. In the second wave, we were able to start something called dexamethasone. It's a potent anti-inflammatory. As COVID tends to really um, rev up your immune system to a point that the immune system is actually damaging the body. So we need to calm that down a bit. And recently, we've been using a, a drug called tocilizumab as well. It's a, a rheumatic uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis type drug okay. that certain people can really help to calm that down. And I'm noticing people that used to for sure be on a ventilator within a, within a day or two are now not getting to that point. So we have some things that have really, really helped the situation. Right. You still don't want to get it, though, right? <laughs> I, I agree with you. And this is why I think prevention is the best thing, and that's why vaccination is so important. And, of course, at the point that we are right now, doing whatever we can to, you know, reduce our contacts, uh, uh, you know, uh, wearing masks while indoors and these types of things. Right. Okay. Why do you think... At this point, uh, just about to hit April here in 2021, more younger people seem to be falling ill with COVID. What do you think is going on there, ending up in the hospital with COVID? Yeah, this is an important aspect. I think part of this is, I think that there's a a thought that the way it's been presented is that because it's deadly to young people. And of course, we want to still avoid it. But part of the reason we're seeing this is because the COVID variants tend to be especially big in essential workplaces. These are places that are not closed in the lockdown. We need them. Grocery stores, factories, food processing plants. And we see that people can get more easily in infected in these congregate environments. And if you look at, look at it, the people that are most likely to work in these areas are aged 25 to uh, 59. And that's part of what we're seeing. Plus, you've taken away a lot of the older individuals with l- long-term care being vaccinated. We've right, barely right. seen any of uh, LTC being admitted. So these are part of the reasons why we're seeing it in the younger group. It's not necessarily that the virus is now targeting younger people. Plus, as you say, I mean, you're in Mississauga, you're in Peel region, you're like in the land of the warehouse, right? <laughs> land of the distribution center, right? A lot of people working close together. You know, you're a hotspot. Have been a hotspot for a long time. 
We have been. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. if you look at uh, what's happened, even when things were getting better in the summertime uh, in uh, 2020, you know, we were still having grumbling cases going on. And we found what's called the what I call the occupational to household transmission chain. This is one of the biggest drivers of the pandemic, especially here in Peel, but all over Canada. And you'll see that this is part of the reason why I've been very critical of people constantly saying, stay home, stay home, stay home, because the people who are unfortunately being affected by the pandemic uh, disproportionately can't stay home. And, you know, it's not parties that these young people are going to. It's people that are essential workers. And I think it's important for us to really recognize this this far into the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we have a lockdown likely coming up. The lockdown is not going to do anything to help uh, uh, this area, this huge area of transmission. Hmm. Lockdown likely coming up. Do you think we need another lockdown? You know, I think that at this point, with the with the cases going the way they are, I think uh, certainly a lockdown is uh, on the table. I suspect it's going to happen sometime this week, based on uh, what uh, Premier Ford was saying. Yeah. But I think that people have again, uh, lockdown is let's just lock things down. It's going to make things better. And like I said, a lot of transmission is happening in in places that are not affected by lockdown: homeless shelters, jails, uh, congregate living settings, congregate work sure. settings. And I think that's really important for people to to recognize. And this is not something you hear a lot. In the conversation about uh, transmission. Okay. Well, I have to ask you. I took a number of phone calls yesterday from people who are, um, you know, who who have they they told me yesterday on the AstraZeneca news about blood clots and uh, pausing use for people under the age of fifty five. Um, that if it was offered to them, they would. Uh, they would opt for something else, even if that mean, meant that they had to wait uh, in order to get a dose of, say, the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine. Yesterday, the prime minister said, take the first one that's offered to you. It's our best path out of this nightmare. Um, what, what do you think? Should people take whatever is offered to them? Um, doctor, what do you think? On vaccines. Yeah, at this point, I would know. Obviously, it's a very complicated situation with AstraZeneca. We've, we've, we've seen some hurdles with it right from the beginning. And uh, unfortunately, some of the, the hurdles, I think, have poisoned the well in what was otherwise a, you know, a safe and effective vaccine. And, you know, even if you look aside from the 60% efficacy number, it has, just like Pfizer and Moderna, almost 100% efficacy at preventing hospitalization and death. And those are the two most important metrics in this pandemic. And AstraZeneca does that. But yes, there's, we've uh, d- discovered a small um, risk of clots. It's a very small risk in, in Europe. We haven't seen any evidence of this in Canada yet. Over, I think, 15 million doses in the UK and India as well. So I think there's certainly something going on and it needs to be looked into. But if you kind of weigh that tiny risk with the public health emergency that we're seeing on our hands, I think giving AstraZeneca, when I do all the calculations, is probably the right thing to do. Doctor, your time this morning is greatly appreciated. I thank you so much. Great to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. Take Dr. Care. Uh, Suman Chakrabarty, an infectious disease specialist at the Trillium Health Partners, joining us today in Mississauga. Your political fix after the news on City News.
Wednesday, March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 12 degrees in Smith Falls, 13. And here's what's making news at this hour. Pfizer has released a study it did on its own vaccine. Over 2,300 people between the ages of 12 and 15 were given their vaccine or a placebo. Every single one given the drug did not get COVID. A percentage of those given a placebo did. And this study was once again between the ages of 12 and 15. Ontario Medical Association has done its own study to find out exactly who is spreading misinformation about COVID and vaccines. The group says results will surprise people, especially with the age group most likely to do the spreading. It's releasing these findings at 1 o'clock this afternoon. What's in a name? Well, for one vaccine maker, enough to change it. AstraZeneca in Europe, now referred to as Vaxzevria. The company requested the name change, which was granted last Thursday by the European Medicines Agency. An update on the arrest of that man in connection with a random beating of an elderly Asian woman in New York. Police say it was a parolee who was convicted of killing his mother nearly 20 years ago who's going to be charged with this hate crime. Police say Brandon Elliott is the man seen on video kicking and stomping the woman on Monday. City News Time, 9.31. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 13.10 AM. It's time to score your political fix. Carl Belanger is here. He's the president of Traxion Strategy. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Rob. Great to hear from you. Jason Leader is the president of Enterprise Canada. Good morning, Jason. How are you, Rob? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad everybody's well, and thanks for the time this morning. Let's uh, jump right into it. We had media reports this week suggesting that the prime minister insists there will be no spring election. Forget about a spring election. Okay, the only way there's going to be a spring election is if it's triggered by the opposition parties. Carl, do you believe that? Yes. You uh, do? I, okay. I believe that it is quite possible in light of the third wave, which has begun uh, in, in certainly in Ontario, uh, in Alberta, in B.C., and just starting in Quebec, that the Prime Minister thought, considering what happened in Newfoundland, uh, that it might not be so wise to trigger a pandemic election as we're struggling with this third wave, which would basically put himself in a position to defend his management of the pandemic at the wrong time. Uh, so, so that said, it's not impossible for the prime minister to say it will be triggered only by the opposition and then deliver a budget. That triggers uh, an election. That yeah. triggers an election by forcing the opposition to vote against it. Now, of course, we have to consider that the NDP has basically said that they will swallow themselves all and, and keep that government afloat because they do not want a pandemic election. So how far can the Liberals go to make the budget unpalatable to the NDP? Uh, I don't think they will go that far. Uh, I don't think they're interested that much to, to trigger that election at this time. What do you think, Jason Leader? <clears throat> well, things really changed in the last two weeks, and you know, it's 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 just indicative of the times, right, Rob? And I think Carl's Carl's right. So, so just like to be clear, two weeks ago, the prime minister was planning a spring election. He was planning to bring in a budget on April nineteenth. He was planning to go walk over to the governor general shortly afterwards, whether it's that day or in the following week, and trigger an election. That plan seems to be uh, on on life support uh, because of the things that 
that Carl mentioned, the third wave getting out of control, some vaccine delays, um, the AstraZeneca sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, uncertainty over exactly, you know, how many doses and who it can be given to. So, um, you know, things things changed, and and you know, and so now he's presenting it as 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 as, as he wants to. The, the opposition is not forcing an election; it is not in their interests. And no matter essentially what's in that, in that budget, which is going to be a huge spending document right. um, in all sorts of different ways, um, they're not they're not uh, going to have an election. So um, the prime minister, uh, you know, must be sort of uh, cursing his his bad luck because he missed his opportunity in the fall um, when yep. Mr. Horgan went and got a mandate and now he might miss this opportunity in the spring and i'll tell you you know he was going to win an election this spring and and you know the fall he probably wins again still but uh he's got to be cursing his bad luck because the the the, the conditions were perfect for him well, to I mean, win a big majority yeah, government. jason talks about bad luck but if the budget had been tabled in the normal window which is early march it would have happened so you we, know, we, we, we might be in the election right now. If that, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the reality is that some of the timing has been controlled by the prime minister. Uh, he could have gone, right? But he always tried to somehow set up the opposition or find a way to blame the opposition. And he almost had that opportunity. And you could see him. He did a media tour uh, about uh, just a month ago, where he was blaming the conservatives and the opposition for being obstructionist and preventing work from moving forward in the House and so on and so forth. He was setting up the stage, uh, but it was a, a little too late, considering the window that the budget is coming in at. So do you think then, uh, Carl, to, to Jason's point, he's kind of saying, darn it right now, darn it? And maybe Aaron O'Toole is saying... I think I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, that said, uh, I mean, the reason why we're not going to go now is because things will get better eventually. Uh, uh, he knows that the current window would not be good considering the third wave, and I think yeah, the liberal yeah. side just understand that this could be very damaging. I mean, just look at Newfoundland, right? They had a 40-point lead in the polls when the election began. And then the, the, their second wave hit over there. They did not see it coming. It was partly because of the election and the spread in the community. It became a complete gong show. Yep. was delayed and lasted 10 weeks. 10 weeks, yeah. And, and the Liberals ended up with a bare majority. Instead of winning by 40 points, they won by a handful of points. And the Liberals know that they don't have the same kind of margin. They don't have that safety blanket. They don't have 40 points to blow, so they will not gamble it. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, the, 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 you know, how, how big a factor do you think the Newfoundland thing was, Jason? Um, I think some, and, and, and some, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sort of a technical answer, hopefully not a boring one, but I think the Liberals want um, – the Liberals are ahead. Um, generally. And so that means you want as many people as possible coming out to vote. And, and so, you know, if you, if you, if, if, if you've got this uncertainty and you have a really low turnout election, then weird things can happen. Um, like when you're ahead, you want a lot of people out to vote because the truth is you got a better to every person that goes into that, into that, um, you know, voting booth, you got a 40% chance of them supporting you rather than 30, you know, kind of thing. Whereas if you have a low turnout election, that's when how intense people's levels of support and how likely are they to vote. They have, they, those fair factors have a lot bigger um, sort of um, you know impact on the on the on the final result. And so in this kind of a situation, I think I, I would be worried if I were the Liberals about um, calling an election in a third wave with stay-at-home orders, trying to figure out whether or not all my people are going to get voted out by out, out, you know out yeah. by mail. I think they think they're going to have the most voters. The question is, can they get them there? And in a low turn an election or one with different variables and different uncertainties they're probably worried about uh, making sure that they get out there so right. um, but there is a there is a risk Rob right there is a risk um, during a war governments are likely to be reelected after the war after the peace you know Churchill's the most Could be extreme Churchill. example yeah. Yeah. but you yeah. know when everyone takes a breath then they start figuring out who's next you know how, how so it, they, they do probably want to still have this election while there's still a little bit of threat of pandemic okay around. okay yeah but it it grows riskier the longer mr trudeau waits 
right? We can all agree on that? Well, 100%. 100%. 100%. I mean, a, okay, well, okay. me and Jason are 100%, percent. but Carl's not cooperating. I, Way I to do, go, I Carl. So. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I mean... I wouldn't go 100%, uh, but to me, the key factor is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you get out of this pandemic? And, and Jason is right that once you're out, then the issue is no longer the pandemic, except for those who are angry at the pandemic. So, so, so you lose that category of people already, you've lost them. And, and, and so then the issue becomes, what about the recovery? And who do you trust with the recovery? Way more than pandemic management. And uh, in that sense, uh, you then create a debate with a smaller pool of voters, which is where the risk lies with the liberals. Okay. All right. I really want to pick Carl's brain on what's happening with the race in Quebec. Okay. Recently, we had the spectacle of the Prime Minister and Premier Legault playing nice, standing up for Quebec. Stop, stop that Quebec bashing. Okay. Now, according to the polling averages, uh, the Liberals are doing slightly better than 34% across the province of Quebec. The Bloc is at 29 CPC is at 17%, better than actually I thought they were doing when I looked up the numbers today. Uh, Carl, how do you see this Quebec race right now? What are some of the big issues there in Quebec right now? Well, uh, Quebec identity remains at the forefront of the political debate. I mean, Amir Atteron, this professor at the University of Ottawa, became public enemy number one. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's not a single day where there's not not one, two, or three, five or six columns in the Quebec papers every day for the past 10 days. Um, and uh, and uh, the end result is that uh, I think Trudeau saw that uh, this was a problem for him, and that's why he unusually came out strong to defend Quebec. That's not what he usually does. But he knows that right now he needs to protect that Quebec base, um, even though um, uh, he is ahead in the polls, you have to look at the demographics, right? Okay. The liberals, of course, are, are maxing out with the anglophone and the allophone voters, but amongst francophones, there's many areas where it's actually a three-way race mm. between the liberals, the bloc, and the conservatives. That's mostly eastern Quebec. Uh, but elsewhere, the bloc Quebecois is actually ahead in the francophone votes. And the liberals cannot afford to let the bloc pull away too, too far with the francophone votes, uh, or else they could lose 10, 20, maybe 25 seats, uh, which would then make it difficult for them to win a majority. Right. Okay. Okay. Is that how you see things? Uh, per, yeah, uh, Carl's, yeah. Uh, I mean, Carl's the expert on this, right. and I, I, yeah. I follow him. His his analysis, though, is, matches exactly what I am. What I what I see, which is a a the, the risk for the liberals. Uh, you're seeing this as a defensive measure, as Carl said. The liberals, if the liberals lose ten seats in Quebec, their dreams of a majority government are probably getting. You know, I mean, it's probably over at that point if you lose that kind of seats in in Quebec. And the Black Quebecois, it's a strong force. It's the home team, and amongst francophones, you know, it's a safe place to put a vote, especially when sovereignty is not on the table um, right now. So. Um, they've got to really watch it. That's why you're going to see Mr. Trudeau doing a lot of things there. And the idea that he's sort of embracing, you know, I, for some reason, Mr. Legault, uh, you know, who's a conservative, by the way, um, you know, which sort of, um, you know, uh, it sort of punctures that that myth that Quebec is 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 not a conservative province generally, or doesn't won't you know sort of a home team conservative actually can get a lot of votes there. Yeah. But you know, the truth is, those two embracing is quite something. It's and, weird. Uh, it's weird because yeah. I mean, uh, Legault is so unabashedly Quebecois nationalist, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, Trudeau's just not, he's just not that. He's a lot of things, but he's just not that. I don't think. Yeah, it's, it's a bit weird. And, uh, but, you know, you, he's, he, there, it's both, it's in his interest to try to make friends with them. And so that's what he's going to do. And uh, anyway, uh, Carl's bang on. If the liberals uh, bleed at all, that's when dreams go. Yeah, and but that's if they lose Trudeau seats in really Quebec, they're, they're, they, you know? I'm sorry, Jason. If they lose seats in Quebec, they're not going to win a majority government. Right. I don't think. Doubtful. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Doubtful. Yeah. Okay. We'll stop here. And then when we come back, we'll talk about. Uh, the Supreme Court carbon tax decision, how you see that playing out politically. This is The Rob Snow Show. It's your political fix. Part two coming up here on City News.
When it came to opening the business, because I was so young, there was a lot that I didn't know about management, financial management, management of people, um, all around <laughs> management, I think is the word that I, I always come back to. Um, I think that I always had a passion and they knew that I wanted to create a space for people to get their hair done, but I had no idea, even having studied business management, what it really took to open a business as well as sustain a successful business. So in 2014, I was actually working with Angela Sutcliffe. Um, she was my business coach at the time, and she was like, what's your niche? Like, what separates you from other salons? And when we started to really dig, it was the curls. It was the fact that we work with all curl types, curly, kinky, wavy, coily, which is how we identify our curl types. Um, and then you have straight hair as well, of course. Um, but, you know, a, more than 70% of the world has some sort of curl pattern to their hair. And we just realized that that was not being addressed. It wasn't something we learned about in school. So that's, I you know, went to the States and, and I traveled all over to kind of gain the information that I have now to be able to share it with our clients and as well as with other sty stylists. Mm -hmm. So in March when it came, I thought it was gonna last, you know, a week, two weeks, mm -hmm. through, I think it started off at two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool, I have two weeks to just relax, that's fine. So I was actually in a position where I was not happy, so to say, but I was a little bit happy, to be honest, um, just because of what I was experiencing personally. Now, when that extension started to happen, it was not a great feeling. It was very uncomfortable not knowing how I was going to support myself financially. So I'm so excited about the Academy. It's something that I started and I, I launched it during the pandemic. So. <laughs> I've been teaching for a, a number of years. I've been educating for a number of years. I educated at Algonquin. I've educated at Versailles Hair Academy. Um, and I've also educated in my own space, um, in this space and my old space up on Green Bank. And so it was just a continuum of what, you know, I've been doing for these years. When we have a client in our chair, it's not just about making your hair look great. It's about how do you go home and take the, what we've just taught you and emulate that. So now with a world where people want to quote unquote be diverse and inclusive, what does that really look like in a salon setting? And for me, it looks like being able to invite any curl type, any hair type really, you know, cause I can take care of straight hair types just as well as, you know, I can take care of curls. And we cater to all curl types regardless of what you look like on the outside, we got you. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Back to part two of your political fix with Carl Belanger of Traxion, Jason Leader of Enterprise. So on the carbon tax, uh, the prime minister and the liberals win the battle on the carbon tax. Uh, six to three majority vote win at the Supreme Court of Canada. But uh, Jason Leader, does that mean, you know, this is a winner politically? Uh, you know, do you, do you campaign on the fact that you are uh, having a carbon tax, raising a carbon tax, fighting in court over carbon taxes? Uh, is it a winner politically for the prime minister? As a conservative, I really hope he does uh, campaign on that. Oh, really? Okay. You, right. you haven't seen the liberals talk about a carbon tax in quite some time. Like once once a quarter, they come out and they, they announce you know, some new green measure and we got to build back better and it's all going to be based on a carbon tax. But the truth is um, it's not where people's heads are at right now. And, and so, you know, first of all, a carbon tax is designed to, you know, to sort of reduce um, people using carbon transportation, all the things, all the different things that they can do to change their daily life. Well, we've changed our daily, daily life. We're not, we're not commuting. We've, we've essentially shut down the economy for long periods of the last year. Uh, I don't think anyone can argue we haven't done the greenest possible thing. It wasn't for the reason that, that the liberals want you to do it. But the truth is we've done the, the greenest possible thing we could possibly have done over the last year in terms of individual choices. So this is not a political win winner for Mr. Trudeau. Um, he, it's good that he won this case for him. Um, and right. it's okay. It's okay as well, by the way, for Mr. O'Toole that he won this case because okay. he doesn't have to, he can sort of put this behind him in terms of, 
the issue of, of, of whether or not it's constitutional or not, and he can focus on his response, which is, what am I going to do to convince, uh, you know, sort of uh, suburbanites and, and people who care about the environment, which is most people, frankly, that I've got some sort of plan. So it, it's a bit of a gift to both, but Mr. Trudeau would be making a massive mistake if he campaigns on, the, on a carbon tax uh, in the next little bit as, as a centerpiece of a, of a campaign platform, right, right. Okay. and Mr. Um, Mr. O'Toole also would be making a big mistake if he campaigns has the centerpiece of a campaign against the carbon tax. Well, he yeah, still I, he I still says he's going to scrap it. Do you think that's a mistake? Uh, he still says he's going to get rid of it. Don't need one. Don't he need has it. to have a credible environmental plan, and I think right. he will, based on sort of transit and some in things that you know, so lots of different things that they'll put together, and he'll put it in the window. He really cares about this, so I know he's going to have it. I mean, he took on his own party a couple of weeks ago on this yeah. on this particular file. Yeah. So I think he's going to have a, a real plan, but it's got to be credible for for people to believe. And then he, and then he's got to move on. He doesn't win an election on the environment. He he fights it to a draw, right? Fights it to a draw. Okay. Um, yeah, it's kind of like swords and shields, right? You know. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Carl, what do you think, Carl? Well, uh, there's two issues here. Okay. There's the policy, which is uh, carbon pricing uh, yeah. and tariffication. And when you look at the polls, uh, roughly 60% of Canadians are in favor and 40% are opposed. So that means if those are swing voters that uh, there is room to grow for the Conservatives, right? They are right now pulling around 28%, 30%. They could, if they, on this issue alone, can raise their support to 40%, clearly these votes will come from somewhere, likely from the Liberals. So there is some room there. The problem is the perception around the debate and the way it will be framed. And, and I think there was a missed opportunity at the convention where Renault came out strong and said, you know, we must do something about climate change. We must bring forward a plan. We, we believe in it as conservatives. Um, uh, the debate is over. And then his fellow delegates voted down the resolution about how climate change is real. Uh, so, so you're creating the conditions to make what Aaron O'Toole says about climate change not credible for some voters because a lot of Canadians believe that conservatives actually do not believe in climate change no matter what they say about it. Right, right, right. And that's where it will be interesting to see who wins the framing. Uh, is it th about the best way to fight climate change or is it about believing or not in climate change? That's the issue for Aaron O'Toole. That's the biggest weakness right now for him and uh, he's sometimes not helped by fellow conservative premiers. Yeah. That's a really interesting take, Carl, that it may, it, it, you know, carbon tax or no carbon tax, it may come down to believers versus deniers. That's right. Right. Uh, and yeah. that's what played okay. out at the okay. Conservative Convention. And I know that in the books, and Jason will know this more than I do, but in the policy books, there is there is, there is material about climate change, and now, uh, you know, we need sure. to fight it. It's yeah. there in the CPC playbook. Yeah. The problem is about perception. Nobody goes to read the CPC policy book. <laughs> they, all, they all see what the, the delegates did and how it's been spun Come and on. framed by, by the media and, and others. Jason has it by the bedside right there. Right <laughs> there. <laughs> Oh, quick right reference guy, that, quick reference guy. Is that, is that even legal under the party uh, policy guideline? Um, what do you think? Believers versus deniers. It's an interesting uh, way to look at things. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. No, Carl's, Carl's right. I mean, the, the question here is, a, it's a question, this is a values question, right? Like, is this, and just to dig a little deeper, Rob, like this is, it used to be that um, the easiest way for me or Carl, guys like us, political operatives, to predict what you, how you were going to vote in the next election, if you gave me certain demographic traits, like do you, do you own a house, do you rent, um, how far do you live away from your workplace, do you have kids, do you go to church, like well, those are the things that you know, we could easily, like with startling accuracy, if you gave us a demographic list of a, a, a person, we could tell you probably what party you're likely to vote for. Well, that, the case is a lot of those things are falling away. Do you believe that a carbon tax is the right thing to do is like the most polarizing and most predictive of all of the variables that I've mm -hmm. just described, mm -hmm. which is absolutely insane to me that if you'd have told me that 20 years ago. So like there, this is a values based discussion. That's why Carl's right to describe it as a values based one, right? With do you believe it or not? Do you think it's the right thing? Or can you be trusted to act? Those are the questions. Yeah. 
that people are going to be asking themselves. It's not about policy. And the, 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 one of the biggest, the Liberals' big successes is after Stefan Dion lost on a carbon tax, reframing the carbon tax into this thing, this value, instead of a policy, which is what Carl's describing, right? Do you believe in it or not? That's the question. And, and conservatives say, I believe in a carbon tax. I just don't think this carbon tax, which, by the way, has been in, in place for several years now, like, what, what, decisions have you made carl or 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 rob that are different because of the carbon tax like have you made any like that's what it's designed to do right right, right, right. well well you know yeah plus if you're getting all the money back exactly right yeah exactly because they they have also trying to argue efficacy the liberals are trying to argue values yeah plus one of the things that the liberals have done very effectively is to convince people that it's painless right well what do you worry you're getting all the money back you know I tax well, they want to have it both ways on yeah. that, right? Yeah. It's, so pain, it's so painful. You're going to change your decisions. It's the thing that can save the world. But don't worry. It's but you won't feel a right? thing. But you won't feel a thing. So this is, you know, uh, uh, there's been some thought. Uh, maybe there's some headway to be made by uh, Aaron O'Toole and the conservatives. How to turn this carbon tax into a winning issue is you bring one in and then you play around with the rebate structure. You, you don't have people do it on their taxes. You do it like a GST thing. Send them a check four times a year. Or uh, y- y- you really emphasize the rebates for those people who really vote conservative and ensure that up, that suburban voters and, and, and rural voters who are quite likely getting shortchanged on these rebates anyway just because of their lifestyle. And you really... Um, kind of firm things up there. I don't know. I don't know. Because if it's a values question, people just don't believe Aaron O'Toole or believe conservatives on the climate change file, whether he should spend even five minutes on it. So, Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, of course, the the liberals know that they have some weaknesses on that front, which is why they have acted when it came time to enact their values um, to somehow protect their right flank. Right, you you know the the the, the, the rebate is one example. Uh, nationalizing a pipeline is another example. Um, you know, uh, so 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 if the debate shift, there is an opportunity for the NDP and the Green on the other side. Mm. But so far, uh, especially in this pandemic, uh, you haven't seen the Green Party, especially, make any kind of headway about environmental issues. Uh, on the contrary, they've kind of been missing in action for the past few uh, few months, um, which you know is probably a huge relief for the liberals if the debate is going to be part of the main narrative of the election. Okay, what is the liberals' biggest weakness right now, Jason Leader? Their biggest I vulnerability. I think it's ambition. To be honest with you, I think I, if they get too ahead of themselves, if they just run the next campaign on, we manage the pandemic. Okay, we're going to manage the next little bit. Okay. I think that they probably win the election, uh, you know, and I'm not happy about that, but that's probably true. If they start talking about some grand plan to remake Canadian society and get people wondering who's paying for all this, that's their biggest vulnerability. And the truth is they fall into this trap all the time. So it's great news for me and, and the rest of the conservatives is it, the, probably the only way that Mr. O'Toole can win the next election, election campaign um, realistically is if the liberals just get too ahead of themselves and they're talking about all these things that are just so divorced from, you know, the regular Canadians who are like, how can I see my mom? How can I get back to normal? How can I make sure my kids are in school? And, uh, you know, how can I make sure that I've got a job for the next little bit? Um, and, and I think they're going to get, if they get too ambitious and start talking about remaking Kennedy and society and, you know, this is the time to, to do everything that we wa- always wanted to do, that's when they start to, I think, um, you know, lose their luster a little bit. So I'm hoping they get a little too ambitious for them. Too big, ambition, big for them ambition. What's the Liberals' biggest weakness, Carl? Well, I think there is certainly voters' fatigue. I mean, in this, their second mandate, um, there's the management of the pandemic and the vaccination rollout, which has been an issue, and we're entering the third wave. And we may face a fourth wave uh, uh, in, in not too far down the road. Uh, so, so those are two big weaknesses. But more importantly, the biggest weakness of the liberals, and it's not unsimilar to what Jason is saying, is their incapacity to manage the hype. Um, and we've seen it on the vaccination rollout. It's a prime example where, you know, we have the most contracts in the world. Mm. And yet when you look at the data, we are 62nd in the world. Um, so, so that disconnect between how they're overhyping the success of their 
policies and the actual result, uh, it's starting to erode. Uh, the liberal base, uh, which is why you're seeing, uh, you know, the NDP actually polling fairly well, especially in Ontario, which uh, yesterday was a poll released with them at, at 25 percent. That is quite high for the NDP and a big problem for the liberals down the road. Thanks to both of you for this week. Always great to hear from you. Well, see you, Carl. See you, Rob. Yep. Carl Belanger from Traxion, Jason Leader, President Enterprise Canada. Carl used to work for a guy named Jack Layton. And uh, Jason used to work for a guy named Stephen Harper. Andrew coming up with the 10 o'clock news, and then it's the talk back hour on the Rob Snow Show on City News. Wednesday, March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 12 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's 13. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. An infectious disease expert is weighing in on the various vaccines and whether you should hold out for any one in particular. Dr. Suman Chakrabarty is with Trillium Health in Mississauga. He tells the Rob Snow Show there is no reason to reject the AstraZeneca shot. It has, just like Pfizer and Moderna, almost 100% efficacy at preventing hospitalization and death. And those are the two most important metrics in this pandemic. And AstraZeneca does that. He says there is a very small risk of blood clots in Europe. No cases of that in Canada. The doctor says it does need more study, of course. But if you weigh that tiny risk with the public health emergency, taking the shot is the right thing to do. And there's also good news for those who are concerned about vaccinations on children. Pfizer says a study it has conducted on its own product showed 100% effectiveness on people between the ages of 12 and 15. City News reporter Kevin Meisner now at Queen's Park this morning with the latest on the race to inoculate. The latest study results show the Pfizer COVID-19 shot is 100% effective in children ages 12 to 15. As we hear from ABC's Chuck Sievertson, all of the volunteers in this trial showed strong antibody response and no unusual side effects. It was a placebo-controlled trial, meaning some of the children got fake shots. 18 children who got a placebo shot became infected. None of the children who got the real vaccine developed COVID-19. This could be big news for governments hoping 
hoping to expand vaccination programs for younger children ahead of the return to school for the next school year. Now, today, people 65 and over can start booking their vaccine appointments in York and Halton regions. Kevin Meisner, Queen's Park. City news time at 10.04. We're going to get off and on rain through the day today and temperatures will continue to drop to about 8 degrees this afternoon. And then the colder weather moves in along with some snow and that will be tomorrow morning expecting 2 to 3 centimetres in Ottawa. Uh, right now in Ottawa it's 11 degrees and in Smith Falls it's 13 We've been living with COVID-19 for over a year, and that has led to mental health struggles for many through this pandemic. The chair of neuroscience at Carleton is examining the impact the past year will have on people's long-term mental well-being. Here's City News reporter Alex Gouge. Dr. Kim Hellmans feels nobody is going to be left completely unscathed coming out of the pandemic. She explains some might just feel weathered after, but it could exacerbate things if someone is already experiencing mental health issues. She tells me war is the closest collective traumatic experience to the pandemic folks have faced before. So we can kind of approximate these spaces of, you know, society kind of cha- changing, you know, our, our normal social patterns being interrupted. You know, wartime is, is approximate that to, approximate that to a certain extent. The doctor is also worried that some people who have increased their drug and alcohol use during the pandemic will have a hard time reducing that afterward. Alex Gouge, City News. And Chief Public Health Officer for the country, Dr. Theresa Tam, is urging everyone to remain isolated as much as possible over the upcoming holidays, including Easter and Passover. She says Canadians should save gatherings for a better time in the future. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Everything continues until it doesn't. This is the Talk Back Hour. Take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get. Take whatever you can get and don't go anywhere. Those are the two big talking points that I want to get into this morning with your help, with your contributions, your phone calls. 750-1310, 750-1310, uh, The Prime Minister said it yesterday. Look, when it comes to the vaccines, take whatever you can get. Take whatever you're offered. Can we play the clip, please, of the uh, Prime Minister yesterday? during his news conference. Roll tape. The bottom line for Canadians is the right vaccine for you to take is the very first vaccine that you are offered. The more we get Canadians vaccinated quickly and safely, the quicker we'll be able to get back to a semblance of normality. Uh, and with the, the, the variants uh, that are uh, more severe and more transmissible, uh, increasing around the population. We need to make sure we're doing everything we can to get through this. Okay, so the Prime Minister said yesterday, take whatever you're offered, okay? Even if it's AstraZeneca. And maybe the AstraZeneca vaccine, yeah, lots of bad press about it. Maybe it's not your first choice. Um, Regardless, that's the vaccine you should take. Is that what you're going to do? I'm just curious, okay? I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Um... Me, I would take it. I would take it. I would. Um, Not yet 50. But if if that was the only one that's on offer, I'd take it. I would. Um, Would you? Or, uh, I heard this a lot yesterday, would you wait a little bit longer if it means you can get one of the other vaccines? If it means you get one of the other vaccines, AstraZeneca, no thanks, I'll wait. I waited a year. <laughs> What's, why not wait a little bit longer if it means I can get a Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson dose? And on lockdowns, this is something else I want to get into today. I could totally see another lockdown. I think there could be another lockdown. I don't have any inside information. They're doing a lockdown in British Columbia right now, circuit breaker. I think a lockdown for Ontario could be announced by Premier Ford as soon as tomorrow. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, I don't know if there should be. I want to know what you think. That's why we do the talk back hour. Maybe there should be. Maybe there shouldn't be. I could see both sides of it. But I know this. Governments love to announce bad news just before a long weekend. So tomorrow, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock would fit the bill. (laughs) Bad news would drop. This is what Doug Ford said uh, yesterday on lockdowns. 
Well, uh, everything's on the table right now. So, folks, be prepared. I'm asking you, don't make plans for Easter. That's what I can, I can tell you. Uh, I, I won't hesitate uh, to, to, you know, lock things down if we have to. I did it before. I'll do it again. Nothing's more important than, than our health. I did it before, and I'll do it again. What should he do? <laughs> what should he do? 750-1310, 750-1310. 613-750-1310. Uh, let's start here. Heather in Connecticut. Good morning, Heather. Hi, good morning, Rob. How are you? I'm great, Heather. Thank you. Good. I'm going a little off topic, Rob. I'm calling for a friend okay. who called me this morning. They went on the on the phone line to see if they could get an appointment. The first, right at 8 o'clock, the first person they talked to said they were in the wrong age group. Uh, they're 70 plus, which was incorrect. They called back a second time and they said, well, your card is frozen and under investigation because you've called in too many times. Hmm. The third time they called like in... your OHIP card? No, your health card. Your health card. Yeah, your OHIP card. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The third time the lady they spoke with said, no, that's totally incorrect. They have missed hmm. some of you. Wow. Okay. Not good. Not good. No, no. So where does it stand on trying to get a vaccine appointment for your friend exactly exactly so they're going to keep trying i've tried several times myself yeah and the second person said no you're under investigation under investigation under investigation by who i don't know <laughs> yeah. well, like, I, that, you know what i've heard a lot of crazy things but i uh, i haven't heard anything like that you're under investigation you've called too many times you're under yeah, investigation the, yeah the card is frozen and the card is frozen Obviously, someone wasn't trained properly. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah. But I've yeah. have I've heard a lot of things, um, but I have not heard that. That's a new one for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Thank Heather. You Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 If anybody else has experienced anything like that, has anybody else been? <laughs> you know, you've called too many times. We're freezing your card. Uh, anyone have anything similar to to report along those lines? Seven five zero thirteen ten. Uh, Anne in Ottawa. Anne, good morning. Hi. One one thing I'm wondering about when I'm hearing difficulties with the card, didn't one of your other callers, David, say that you can't use the red and white health card? It won't accept it. Okay. Uh, So Um, people might want to be cognizant of that. I I don't know. I have a It's pretty crazy that there are still red and white health cards floating around. No (laughs) kidding. Didn't the NDP start on that crusade and we're we're still where we are? Well, it was Dalton McGinty's government that vowed to replace every one of them because they don't have, uh, well, they don't have your picture, first of all. They don't have an expiration date either. So, yeah. I um, know. Yeah. But I, I, and for some reason, people will just cling to those until they're almost worn down to the nub, you know? I I don't get it either. Yeah. All right. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Regarding the vaccine, okay, we we have been kind of thrown to the wolves as older folk okay. um, because, like, we're hearing all this bad stuff going on. Like, it's been a nightmare listening to the AstraZeneca stuff. Mm-hmm. And in any case, I want Pfizer or Moderna. You like, do. I'm all over right. 65. I'm, you know, like another year over 65. So, like, it makes a difference which side of 65 you're on, honest to God. Like, right. Uh, and... Uh, like, I don't think I'll have to wait that long to get it, because yeah. if they're doing the over 70s now, I, I would think in a week or two, they'll be doing the over 65. So I will wait. I, I don't know. If, like, and you're hearing all this stuff, like it's going back and forth. First of all, we, they, they said anyone over 65 shouldn't get it. And then, oh, well. And then they okay. changed their mind. Yeah. yeah then they then fl- it's well, okay if you're over on. 65. Yeah. And now they're saying you shouldn't get it if you're under 55. And I, I heard the whole scientific explanation for that, and it makes sense. But it's been kind of like you just sort right. of cringe i don't know yeah like, yeah get whatever you want but well you know, yeah and i you know and i think this is just human nature it's mm-hmm. it's like well what's the advice going to be two weeks from now mm-hmm. right? uh, yeah exactly yeah. Right. Anyway, yeah. I'm, so, I'm so, Anne, Anne, yeah. I'm just wondering here. Uh, you know, I'm trying to picture yes. Anne in Ottawa, loyal caller to the Rob Snow Show. Finally, it's her turn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they've called her name. You're you're up next, Anne. Yeah. And it's the AstraZeneca vaccine. What are you gonna do? Well, what are you, the what, thing what are you is, do? I I think from what I'm hearing, when you're signing on to the provincial portal and they're doing it by age, you are getting either Pfizer or Moderna. That's mm-hmm. my impression from talking to a few people. Right. So I think you get AstraZeneca mostly through the pharmacies, okay. I think. And right. I'm not going to get called. I'm going to have to 
kind of sign on to it. And that sounds like it's a bit of a nightmare, but, you know, I'll, I'm, well, I'll do it. I'm, but no, I don't want AstraZeneca. I, I know it'd be so tempting. Like, just get it because you're there. But I kind of think that isn't what's going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm in a dream state. I don't know. But everybody who's called you has said, you know, the old, over kind of 70 crowd, they've all said it's either Pfizer or Moderna that yeah. they've gotten. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay. All right, Ann. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Yep. So she's hopeful, I guess, that she, it would be it would be one or the other. She's not a big fan of given everything that she's heard about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Steve in Canada. Good morning, Steve. Hey, Rob. Hi, doing? Steve. I'm good. So, Thank you. So, yeah. you know, I'm 52. 52. And I think okay. I'm close enough to that 55 that if it was AstraZeneca, I'd probably take it. Okay. Um, right. Wouldn't have a big issue with this under 55 alert that just came out a few days ago. Right. But uh, I'm, I'm more concerned. Like, I, I work with a lot of Americans. I work for an American company. I was just talking to someone in the States today. He just got his second dose of Moderna in Austin, uh, Austin, Texas. And okay. I have family in Syracuse, and they've all got their second do- doses, all wow. my, my older aunts. Oh. And it, it blows me away because they're all telling me that down there, Moderna is 21 days, and they're like clockwork. They're getting their second dose. And fi- or sorry, 28 days. And Pfizer is 21 days, and they're getting their second doses. And we're waiting. I, uh, my, my RMT told me she got her shot yesterday. And she's got to wait four months for her second dose. And she's a healthcare in, worker. And she's she a works in healthcare. Worker. Worker. She, she, she frontline, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. RMT, yeah. but she's, you know, yeah. she, she sees patients. Yeah. My daughter is in a similar type of uh, position. And she said, do I get it? I said, I would go. But now I'm thinking she's going to wait four months for her second dose. And I don't know, like, I still haven't heard anything on the efficacy of what happens 21 days versus 30. It's all over the map. I, I wish they would. They would be a, a lot more consistent and uh, tell us why, right? I and mean, what's going on and what the risks are of waiting that long. Um, is, is it way better for me to wait an extra two months and line up and get two doses close together or go now and get the first? Like, I, I don't know what to do anymore. Right. Okay. Thank you, now, Steve. Oh, uh, sorry. One, sorry. One more, yeah. one yeah. more really, really quick point on this is, is that um, when we talk about uh, the, these mRNA versus the regular ones and temperature and all this, when, when I line up, and, and I fill in my form online. If I choose, hey, I'm, I'm diabetic or, hey, I'm over 55 or, hey, they should have that system set up to say, okay, you should not have Moderna because you're under 55 or uh, uh, AstraZeneca because you're under 55. And you should not have this one because of this condition or whatever. Right. And they should pipeline you and say, you know, you might wait an extra two weeks for Pfizer because you fit in this and that. Because right of these conditions. You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, should, sure. they should pipeline people. And if it's a longer line for some because we're not getting as much Moderna or Pfizer, then then that's the line, right? And and that's the way they should do it so that everyone has the best, most equitable uh, solution for their condition. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, three down. We'll be right back. Uh, one quarter in the books. Rob Snow Show. Talk back hour, 750-1310. Several lines available for the first time this morning. 750-1310. This is City News. When it came to opening the business, because I was so young, there was a lot that I didn't know about management, financial management, management of people, um, all around (laughs) management, I think is the word that I I always come back to. Um, I think that I always had a passion and they knew that I wanted to create a space for people to get their hair done, but I had no idea even having studied business management, what it really took to open a business as well as sustain a successful business. So in 2014, I was actually working with Angela Sutcliffe. Um, She was my business coach at the time and she was like, what's your niche? Like what separates you from other salons? And when we started to really dig, it was the curls. It was the fact that we work with all curl types, curly, kinky, wavy, coily, which is how we identify our curl types. Um, And then you have straight hair as well, of course. Um, But you know, more than 70% of the world has some sort of curl pattern to their hair. And we just realized that that was not being addressed. It wasn't something we learned about in school. So that's, I you know, went to the States and, and I traveled all over to kind of gain the information that I have now to be able to share it with our clients and as well as with other sty- stylists. So in March, when it came, I thought it was gonna last, you know, a week, two weeks through, I think it started off at two weeks. And I was like, cool, I have two weeks to just relax, that's fine. So I was actually in a position where I was 
not happy, so to say, but I was a little bit happy, to be honest, um, just because of what I was experiencing personally. Now, when that extension started to happen, it was not a great feeling. It was very uncomfortable not knowing how I was going to support myself financially. So I'm so excited about the Academy. It's something that I started and I, I launched it during the pandemic. So I've been teaching for a, a number of years. I've been educating for a number of years. I educated at Algonquin. I've educated at Versailles Hair Academy. Um, and I've also educated in my own space, um, in this space and my old space up on Green Bank. And so it was just a continuum of what you know I've been doing for these years. When we have a client in our chair, it's not just about making your hair look great. It's about how do you go home and take the, what we've just taught you and emulate that. So now with a world where people want to quote unquote be diverse and inclusive, what does that really look like in a salon setting? And for me, it looks like being able to invite any curl type, any hair type really, you know, cause I can take care of straight hair types just as well as, you know, I can take care of curls. And we cater to all curl types regardless of what you look like on the outside, we got you. Time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. We have this news event going on right now and a lot of heavy hitters are there. From the uh, from the Trudeau government and from the Ford government and the mayor of Toronto is there, the uh, increasingly shaggy looking John Tory. But they're announcing $925 million investment that cost shared. Uh, to build a vaccine production facility in Toronto where there's a Sanofi production facility that makes a lot of vaccine for influenza. This is actually the facility that uh, Mr. Champagne recently said didn't exist, was sold off by the Mulroney government, and here he is at the facility itself um, announcing a $925 million investment to produce made-in-Canada vaccines. Now, it's a great decision. It's just... In my opinion, it's March 31st of 2021. It would have been an even greater decision, say, March 31st of 2020. Well, you know, um, a year late and a dose short, I guess. 1021. 1021 here on City News. The latest Ontario case count numbers are out. 2,333. So that's pretty much the same as yesterday. Uh, 2,333. The number for Ottawa today, sometimes the number in the afternoon, it comes out and it's a little bit higher. The number right now for Ottawa is 124. For the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, so Cornwall area, 20. Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 6. And none in Renfrew. None for the Renfrew uh, Health Unit. Bruce McIntyre is going to join us a little bit later. Eganville leader uh, reporter. We are talking vaccines, we're talking lockdowns, we're talking everything to do with COVID-19 again today. Leo, Ottawa. Good morning, Leo. Hi, Leo. Uh, hi, Rob. Hi, Leo. Um, I just want to make a bit of a thing on the what the Prime Minister was saying. Uh, take the first vaccine that's available to you, okay? Yeah, yes, yes. Now, there's millions of these uh, AstraZeneca vaccines that are still available, right? There's going to still be millions of them, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, so now in phase two, once these other people are uh, vaccinated, uh, they're going to be, uh, there's probably going to be age groups like, you know, 55 and under in that group, because in phase two, they're going to be doing uh, essential workers and stuff like that. And in that group, there'll be people under 55. So he's basically maybe, I'm not sure if I'm understanding him right, but uh, he's basically saying, like, take the first vaccine. So... I'm sure somebody's. He says, take whatever uh, is offered to you. Take the first one offered to you. Exactly. So some of these workers are going to be under 55, you know? Yes. These essential workers. Yes. So so he's basically. uh, You could say he's going. Contradicting the. Contradicting his own advisory panel. Yeah. Contradicting his own advisory panel. Yes. So th- th- this is this is not right. And, and, and let's say something happens down the road. I mean, to these people. I mean, you mean like uh, you know who's going to be accountable for this? You know, like good you question. Know? Yeah, good question. Good question. Yeah, Leo, great point that you make. Let's. Um, we're going to play a longer clip. Just bear with us here. Longer clip from yesterday's news conference includes um, the question, right, from the news reporter. 
Roll tape on it. Okay. Uh, Prime Minister, two weeks ago, we had heard reports about blood clotting issues with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yet you came out and assured Canadians that it was safe and you encouraged them to go get it if it was offered to them. Now we know that there are concerns about this in younger people. Was it a mistake for you to do that? And do you think it will that change the way you give advice about vaccines in future? And, and, and finally, what would you say to the Canadians who, based on your advice two weeks ago, went out and had that AstraZeneca shot? Uh, the advice given by health professionals, the advice that I gave, was that the right vaccine for you is the very first vaccine that is offered. Uh, and Health Canada continues to ensure the safety and effectiveness of any vaccine administered in Canada. Uh, as we've seen over the past number of weeks, there are uh, different yeah, recommendations yeah, okay. and limitations. There. This is part of the problem, too, is that you have the National Advisory Committee on Immunization saying don't do it under the age of 55. Don't use that particular vaccine under 55. But Health Canada to this point, has it's the regulator. It approves the vaccine. And it has said, approve for use for all Canadian adults. Just play the rest of that there. Uh, as we've seen over the past number of weeks, there are uh, different recommendations and limitations given in as the science evolves. But every step of the way, the recommendations that Health Canada makes and that I and other politicians pass along, because none of us are vaccine efforts, but we are uh, there to help amplify the messages by uh, Health Canada that vaccines are safe and effective and that everyone needs to get vaccinated uh, with whatever vaccine is offered to them as quickly as possible. What Whatever vaccine is offered. But I, one of the questions I'm asking is, what if it's the AstraZeneca vaccine? Okay. Uh, Susan, uh, Brockville area. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I'm you. just uh, calling about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, I had the shot. I was in that age category between, you know, in the 60 to 64 range. Okay. Uh, my husband and I both had the, the vaccine. Uh, it would be two weeks on Friday. Um, no problems. We, my husband went online sure. uh, and got it done in Kingston at the pharmacy Yes. Uh, within minutes of each other. Yes. Uh, yeah, you called me so, when you did that, didn't you? Um, yeah. Yes, you did. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Everything's gone well. And, I'm glad uh, to hear that. Yeah. Issue so far. Well, so, I mean, there are, you know, millions and millions and millions of doses have been given out of this vaccine, right? Well, that's, that's just Tens it. of I mean, millions see, of doses. Yeah. There yeah, have been 31 yeah, cases. There have been 31 yeah, cases. Been, right? Exactly. So yeah. to my thinking, I mean... Uh, my husband and I both look at, uh, we're doing it for ourselves, for sure, but right. also in, for the Canadians, like for Canada, like, like just to have this done and get the process going to yes. have people vaccinated. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the odds are surely, you know, pretty good. So, you know, I don't see an issue with it. I'm, okay. You know. You I do it again? It. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm. For I'm, sure. Yeah, I, okay. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure when our next dose is because they didn't give a time frame. It's, it will be within that four months. Uh, so it'll be done in the four months time. And uh, um, as I said, we, you know, we're hoping for the best. And uh, so far, we feel great. So I'm glad to hear that, Susan. Yeah. 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 Thank you for so calling. I encourage other yeah. people if you know if, if the opportunity arises. In that age group, like I wouldn't, I'm not going to say, you know, have it done. Right, 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 the, sure. Yeah. The science behind it, have it done when you're supposed to have it done or the age that you're, they say that the best outcome for it. So, well said. Just yeah. my thoughts. Okay, thank you, thank you. So we've reached halftime. Uh, I should let you know, coming up on uh, our program, a little later, final hour of the program, we're following up. Great uh, front page report from uh, Elizabeth Payne from the Ottawa Citizen, front page Ottawa Citizen, quote, the head of the University of Ottawa Heart Institute is calling for all patient-facing healthcare workers to receive second doses of COVID-19 vaccine without delay after a more than a dozen vaccinated staff members at the Heart Institute became infected. So we are going to be joined. Uh, we put in a call uh, to the Heart Institute this morning uh, and requested uh, an interview with Dr. Thierry Messana. And uh, that's going to come up in the 11 to 12 hour, final hour of the Rob Snow Show on City News.
Police in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, March 31st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 13 degrees. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and in the Valley. Another day, well over 2,000 cases of COVID-19 in Ontario, 2,333, and of that number, 124 are in Ottawa, 6 in Leeds, Granville, Lanark, 20 in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, no new cases today in Renfrew. The results come from about 52,500 tests, 785 of the new cases are in Toronto, 15 more people have also died in Ontario from COVID-19. An infectious disease expert says he feels the Premier is about to add more lockdown measures, but Dr. Suman Chakrabarti says the problem with infection is it's happening in places where the lockdown really won't accomplish anything, like congregate living areas or prisons. Pfizer has released a study it did on its own vaccine. Over 2,300 people between the age of 12 and 15 were given the vaccine or a placebo. Everyone given the drug did not get COVID. A percentage of those given the placebo did. The economy grew by 0.7% in January, so that outpaced what many economists had estimated by a couple of points. It was the ninth monthly increase in a row since economic growth plunged last spring when the pandemic started. The growth, as mentioned, was better than expected. City News Time, 1032. I'm Andrew Boyle. For News Anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Get back to your calls in just a second here. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is speaking at this news conference right now. Let's listen uh, to uh, the Deputy Premier. Mayor Thompson, thank you for your, your cooperation. And MP Sachs, thank you. Congratulations. Welcome to the world of politics in Ottawa. <laughs> You're going to have your hands full, as we all do. But again, congratulations. Because this, this is truly a, a Team Canada effort. And there's nothing and no one that can stop us when we have the collaboration of the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal uh, government. I always joke around. I talk to the Mayor Tory more than I talk to my wife every day. So that's, that's actually a good thing, Mayor. And, uh, and of course... I'd like to acknowledge and thank, again, Sanofi for the incredible uh, show of confidence you have here in Ontario. The new facility will create 300 high-quality jobs and facilitate hundreds of supporting jobs in construction, science, and agriculture. Now more than ever, we understand the importance of having the ability to manufacture products locally. Yeah. So and what's happening is um, there's going to be a cost sharing agreement and it's uh, a total of $925 million in funding for a production facility for made in Canada vaccines um, at the Sanofi uh, location. A big French company makes a lot of influenza vaccine. Liberals denied it ever existed. Now they're um, you're actually going to expand it. Imagine that. Uh, so while that is going on federally, uh, locally, uh, this this is a special meeting of the Transit Commission because, remember, your ridership on OC Transport is like totally plummeted, right? Uh, so there are plans to cut some routes, uh, lay off some staff, I think 70 staff, through attrition. And uh, they're hearing from delegates at the special meeting of the Transit Commission right Often now. Often, I waited shifts that started or ended late at night or early in the morning. I would be the only one or one of the only people on the bus. I certainly didn't have money for a cab. And remember the panic that would set in if my shifts went later than expected and the number of options for getting home dwindled. I remember one night working a shift in Bell's Corners, first realizing that the 172 wouldn't pick me up since it was too late. Then realizing that if I couldn't get out of work in the next 30 minutes, the last 118 of the night would pass. Those 30 minutes came and went. I'm not normally someone who's shy or easily intimidated, but the idea of walking toward home alone from Bell's Corners to wherever I could get a bus, which ended up being Bayshore, didn't seem like a wise or appealing choice, especially when I was already tired from working a 10 hour shift. But it's what I had to do. I also remember pouring over my transit map and checking schedules on my computer. Okay. So that's one of 17, one seven delegates uh, signed up 
to speak to the transit commissioners. Uh, her name is Laura Shant, so we'll be uh, following that as well in municipal government today. This is the Rob Snow Show. Talk back hour, just a taste of some of the news that's happening right now. And let's get right back to our phone lines. We're talking about uh, vaccines, the potential for lockdowns as well could be happening. Maybe tomorrow, something announced. I have no inside scoop, but it could happen. Uh, Doug Ford's done it before and he'll do it again, he says. Uh, let's go to Renfrew. Reagan. Good day, Rob. Yes, sir. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Uh, concerning uh vaccine i'll take any because uh, i prefer any to a bedpan and uh for the people worrying especially the city people worrying about uh, astrazeneca i'm sure the federal government will send all them to the conservative held writings so you won't have to worry not that i'm saying anything but uh, but the other thing I was going to say was simply, uh, I don't believe we should have any more lockdowns, but I do think we should either have uh, maybe a combination of of curfews or countywide travel restrictions, you know, where you can't travel out of your county or, oh, really? or curfews, okay. but keep right. the businesses open. I mean, right. okay. this going okay. back and forth is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. They love to drop bad news the day before a long weekend. So it would um, it'll be right out of the government playbook, really, to do it. And uh, let's play the clip uh, again. Thank you, Regan, of what Doug Ford Thanks, said ye- yesterday during his um, his news conference on a lockdown. Yeah, everything's on the table right everything's now. Everything's on so the table. Be prepared. I'm asking you, don't make plans for Easter. That's what I can I can tell you. Uh, I, I won't hesitate uh, to to you know lock things down if we have to. I did it before. I'll do it again. Nothing's more important than than our health. Did it before. I'll do it again, and don't make plans for Easter. He said yesterday that an announcement might be coming soon on another lockdown. What do you think about that, ladies and gentlemen? Another, another lockdown for Ontario, maybe before the end of the week. I mean, the end of the week for a lot of people is is tomorrow. And that means, you know, say he does it tomorrow. Is he really, if he doesn't do it tomorrow, what's he going to do? Is he really going to tell the people of Ontario what he has planned on Good Friday? Like the holiest day on the Christian calendar, that's when you're going to assemble the media and say, oh, sorry, lockdown. I don't see that happening. Now, I don't know. It's really, it's getting harder and harder to get into the premier's head these days and try and figure out what's going on. But let's work from this hypothesis, okay? That Doug Ford is going to make an announcement about the COVID-19 situation in Ontario where there are rising case counts, increasing spread of the variants of concern, increasing hospitalizations, younger people getting sick, falling seriously ill from COVID, governments of all political stripes. It is a well-worn tactic. They all do it. They love to drop bad news just before the long weekend, usually late Friday, around 4 and 5 o'clock. It's the Easter long weekend, so Thursday instead of Friday, tomorrow instead of Friday. Work from the assumption Doug Ford is going to say something tomorrow, something tomorrow about restrictions because of the COVID situation and 2,333 cases reported across Ontario today. What should he say? What should he do? 750-1310. 750-1310. Seven five zero thirteen ten. Seven five zero thirteen ten. Six one three seven five zero thirteen ten. The Rob Snow Show at Ottawa.CityNews.ca is my email. If Doug Ford's going to make that announcement, if he's going to say anything at all, what should he be saying when he opens his mouth tomorrow? What What do you want to hear? For example, what if he said something like this, folks? 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 <laughs> We're going back into a lockdown, a tight one. I'm sorry I have to do it, but I have no choice. We're not out of the woods yet. I told you we had an emergency break, and I'm sorry, but I've got to slam on the emergency break because of this growing case count. I know it's tough on a lot of people. I'm for the little guy. Yeah, I know Costco's open and Walmart's going to stay open and Canadian Tire will be open and Ikea will be open, but I'm for the little guy. 
Biden. It's far from over, and I said I would, wouldn't hesitate to lock things down again and, and slam on the emergency brake, and now by any measure, it's time to slam on the emergency brake. I wish I didn't have to do it, but I have no choice. I have to do it. I did it before, and I'm doing it again. What if he said something like that? What would you think about that? Would you support that position, or would you be opposed to that position? I look at the situation here in Ottawa by the government's color-coded scheme. We don't even deserve to be in the red zone anymore. We should be in the gray zone. Things have gone from bad to worse. They have deteriorated. All the benchmarks that the government came up with when it drafted this goofy color-coded scheme, they've all deteriorated in Ottawa. Case counts, infection rates, positivity rates, hospitalizations, all getting worse. We're firmly in the red zone. We should really, by rights, be in the gray zone. And maybe it's just a matter of time before we are. Maybe it's just a matter of hours. Doug Ford could come out and make an official tomorrow. I have no insider information whatsoever. But he could be saying, this time tomorrow, I hate to do it to you, but I have to do it to you again. Ontario, you're on lockdown. What would be your reaction to that? If you think back to the lockdown that went into effect on Boxing Day across the entire province, it was in effect until January 23rd. Stay-at-home orders didn't actually expire until the middle of February. But if you think back to the Boxing Day lockdown, it was announced on the 21st of December. And uh, he took a lot of heat for it. People opposed to lockdown certainly didn't want to go through another one. And there were people who thought the premier should have been more aggressive and that it didn't make any sense to announce a lockdown, but make sure people had enough time to go do all their Christmas shopping. So, you know, Santa is uh, long gone. It's Easter bunny time. And here we are. It's lockdown time again, maybe. Because when the Boxing Day lockdown was announced, there were about 2,100 cases in Ontario, December 21st of 2020. Today, there are 2,300 cases in Ontario, and there are more people in the ICU. If 2,100 cases just back before Christmas justified a lengthy lockdown, eh, does that mean an Easter lockdown is justified when, when, when most of the metrics are worse now than they were then? Of course, the big difference is vaccines. We have vaccines now. We didn't have a big vaccine rollout program in December. The vaccines were just getting going. Helen in Westboro. Good morning, Helen. Hi, good morning. Hi, Helen. Good to hear uh, from First you. of all, about the vaccines. Yes. I'm just wondering because I hear that uh, the Pfizer supply that was supposed to come in July is now coming in June. Yes. Yeah. So does that mean those who were put on a four-month waiting list will get it in three months instead? I hope so. I would hope so. It's not what I've heard, of course. but Yes, uh, and yeah. I have an issue with that. Like, I think uh, Trudeau's trying to get as many people vaccinated as he can before an election is called. Hmm. And I think that's his strategy. And it's well, like, you know, maybe whatever the motives, uh, um, and... Far be it for me to think that the Prime Minister would have impure motives, but um, it should be everybody's goal to get as many people vaccinated as fast as possible, right, Helen? Yes. Whatever the motive. Fully right? vaccinated. Fully vaccinated, sure. That's the yeah. issue, okay? Okay, fully because vaccinated. Because we don't know how, if, if we drop to 41%, if you have to wait four months, is what uh, I've heard, Yes. yes. then that's, okay. you know, that doesn't really help. Right. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, yeah. You think he wants to get as many people one dose as possible before yeah, having so an election? Yeah, he can put yeah. that on his pamphlet. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. yep, yep, yep. What if, uh, what if Doug Ford says we're going into lockdown again tomorrow? Uh, I think he'll be crucified. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you... I think people won't be happy about that. Right. Oh, crucified. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Okay? Yes, yes, yes. Grown, grown. Not your best I, work, Helen. Okay, we'll talk soon. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Okay. Um, Navin, Gary, Gary, Navin, home hey, of the Rob. fifty horse hitch. Go ahead. Yes. You, you got her, sir. On, yeah. on the vaccines, I can't believe that this man Trudeau is getting away with pushing the second shot to four months, and yeah. he hasn't been crucified over this already. Well, Pfizer doesn't. It's a wasted shot. Okay. All right. So I can't believe that this man's getting away with it. But anyway, 
All right. On the lockdowns, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Ford comes on and say nothing is more important than your health. Well, again, when you look at the numbers in terms of the population of Ontario, again, we're talking point zero 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 one of the bloody population, and yet we continue to destroy the economy over that. And, and the lies that continuously come out there in terms of our hospitals, oh, we're 100% capacity. We're always at 100% capacity in our in our Ontario Well, be, yeah, being at 100% capacity is nothing new for, like, welcome to exactly. daily life in an Ontario exactly. hospital. Exactly. Right? We, yeah. we haven't built a bloody hospital in, in yeah. decades right. in Ottawa here. So, I mean, it, just the lies that come out that continuously scare people into thinking that we're you know, that you know that we're in this pandemic yeah. and that we have to shut like again, I guess one I, of my I, fears what you know one of my fears is for example we had the CEO of the Ottawa Hospital right three campuses of the Ottawa Hospital uh, you know twenty thousand employees billion dollar budget one of the things that bothers me is that they have a backlog of like fifteen thousand cases right yeah. now just for the Ottawa Hospital. So you can imagine what it is Ontario wide. I, I, I would hate to see that backlog grow longer, you know, and, well, they, and they say that that's what could happen if they have to put, we you are, know, put more yeah. resources into treating COVID patients. In the we have affected far more people, Rob, mm. than this, than this virus will ever affect. It, it still blows my mind. We're at this point, but again, it, it just defies all logic. It defies all common sense. I've had it. If he locks it down, I wish Canadians had backbones. I wish we had a mayor in Ottawa that would stand up and say, I don't give a good goddamn what the premier said. We are open for business. There okay. isn't going to be another lockdown. We will not follow another lockdown. I will I will tell the, the police force, our bylaw, not to enforce anything. I'm done with it. Wake up, okay. Canada. Right. I'm done with it, Rob. Okay. All right, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Calling from Nevin. Uh seven five oh thirteen ten final quarter coming up, Rob Snow Show on City News. Well, we all loved our rock t-shirts growing up, right? It was our badge that, hey, we went to this concert. We knew that band inside out. So we, we kept doing that and kept promoting that. What's, what's sort of happening now is that audience is dying. <laughs> I always say the earth is flat. <laughs> so the 60s rockers are falling off the end of the earth. So you don't see as big a sales anymore because my audience is disappearing. What's sort of helping uh, to promote that history is the kids are buying vinyl and luckily we have a vinyl shop in the neighborhood here uh, record center so what's happening is I've seen kids come in with their dad and the dad say hey do you have any Beatles shirts do you have any CBGB do you have any of this I said well why uh, you know he said well because my daughter's into it she's wearing my t-shirt so slowly it's coming back right the kids are I think getting fed up with the generic music that's out there and they want to click into something that, first of all, links them to their parents, something that they uh, thoroughly enjoy now, and maybe they're passing it on to their grandkids. Pandemic has been a couple of things, definitely hard on everybody. So much uh, uh, messaging that's out there that people don't understand, stats that every day, Jesus Murphy, like I'm getting a headache just reading this stuff, right? So, so really it was just trying to understand where we were gonna go from there. The city of Ottawa all of a sudden said, everybody's got to wear a mask. You got to wear it on the bus. People were scrambling, okay? And I had, uh, the store next door had really big windows, so I just flooded the window with masks. Well, that was the, the activity that saved the business. Uh, people were coming in buying two, three, four masks at a time at 20 bucks a pop here. <laughs> but my masks were so different. They were the Rolling Stones, Beatles, Queen, all the pop culture. Everything else out there was medical masks. <laughs> and right, so people said, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to show my rock and roll. So it became the new, the new T-shirt, as far as I'm concerned. Well, what I've done, I'm Hintonburg. I'm at now at uh, 1114A Wellington Street, which is next door to the Fab Gear Store. <laughs> And the reason I've changed names, I've rebranded the store, is because I was planning on retiring. And, and in December, I went, well, I'm not going to retire. But I've committed to changing what the store is about. So I came up with a new name, Fab Gears Rock Shop, where legends are dressed. <laughs> and essentially get that message out. I prefer if the shirt don't fit, you come in, you try another one on. People like to feel the fabrics for clothing. It's amazing. Y'all come in and go, Oh, I love that. Oh, can I try this? 
So that's the big difference. I'm not out to make a gazillion dollars. I stick the way I am, old school. I take cash, we take cards. Come on in and talk to the owner. To talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Pretty sure I just saw Mr. Champagne. Trudeau cabinet minister said, this is a huge announcement, right? $925 million for vaccine production in uh, at this facility in Toronto. And it will open, it will open in 2027. I heard, I saw that. Yeah, I'm watching the captions on the screen here. Yeah, that's what our... 2027, 2027. That's okay. what Cormac is telling so me as well. That's great. It's great. Five, you know? five six okay, years. Okay, so, so not really for this pandemic. Let's hope this is over by 2027. We're not talking, uh, you know, uh, lockdowns and hand sanitizer and face masks by the year 2027. All of this is, a you know, a memory, right? Uh, <laughs> 2027. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Steve in Ottawa. Steve, good morning, Steve. Good morning. How are you doing today? Uh, rock solid, buddy. How about you? <laughs> Not bad. Good. Uh, 2027, <laughs> Steve. 2027. <laughs> right? Big announcement today. Vaccine production comes to Toronto six years from now. Six years yeah. from now. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. What can I tell you? <laughs> right, 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 right. That's about what uh, it takes. Let me see. We could build about 12 kilometers of light rail in that time in Ottawa. So, anyway. <laughs> go, go ahead, Steve. Sorry. So, that's okay. We uh, got some good news from our pharmacist this morning. My wife got a call uh, saying that uh, she's going to be one of the pharmacies here in Ottawa that's going to be doling out uh, vaccines in the next uh, little while. Okay. And she asked us if we could, you know, pre-book. Uh, uh, my wife's uh, 70 years old. She has a little bit of a heart condition. I'm 64, uh, uh, type 2 diabetic with uh, insulin dependency, and uh, I have uh, liver problems a bit and kidney problems due to the uh, uh, diabetes. So she asked, you know, to we'll book you in, can we call you? And I said, yeah, no problem. Right. And she asked if uh, we had a preference, and uh, we said, no, we don't care. We just want to get it done. Okay. <laughs> So, but they asked. Uh, That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, it's, you know, it's just the first shot, and then we probably have to wait a bit until we get the second one. But you know, what can you do? You what know can what you mean? do? You gotta, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so when are you getting you it? Get. When are you getting uh, it? She's supposed to call us in the next week or two to book a oh, firm see. Okay. appointment. I see. Yeah. I see. Well, so I'm good. I'm glad to hear that. And you're not fussy. You'll take whatever you nope. can get. Yeah. Okay. Take whatever we can get and get it done with. Okay. Yeah. All right. Understood. Steve, thank you. And as far as the lockdowns go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't understand why they wait until all hell breaks loose before they do something. Hmm. Like we knew, you know, like how bad it was, you know, a few weeks back. And they always seem to wait and wait and wait. Right. Yeah, and they keep they you know they keep having the you know they keep releasing these models, right? If yeah. you don't do you know yeah. if you do this, you'll have this many cases. If you don't do this, you'll have this many cases. Everything else. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. What 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 if there is another lockdown though tomorrow? Oh, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother you. Either. Okay, you don't have anywhere to go, Steve. I guess. Exactly. All right, all right, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, moving along, Nick in Ottawa, Nick. Morning, Nick. Hello. You're on the air, sir. Go ahead. Hey, how are you today? Uh, great, sir. Thank you. Thanks just, for asking. Just calling to see why this whole lockdown thing and everything, right out of the get-go last year when it all happened, why didn't they lock down for six weeks like Australia did and mm -hmm. over in Europe? It could have been over and done with by now. Six weeks. Six weeks. Okay. The six yeah. weeks. Remember they said 15 days to flatten the curve, but didn't flatten nothing. Right. They didn't, didn't okay. do anything. They needed to lock it down for six weeks. And Australia is back to normal. Parts of Europe are back to normal. And now we have the government again trying to control everything, saying, oh, threat another lockdown right before Easter weekend. Well, he has said, you know, I've done it before and I'll do it again. So you're saying yeah, what? They did, he didn't do it, uh, what? He wasn't he tough enough. Didn't wasn't he tough said. enough before. You're he, 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 needs, he needs to shut down everything. Construction, just have essential services. Have your 
Hospital is open, ambulance, fire, police. No construction, no nothing. Shut everything right. down. Well, you'd have to have, you know, grocery, pharmacy, gas, yes. and stuff like that. Yes, right? have yeah, that, yeah, but, yeah. like, if you're a non-essential, stay, stay home. Don't have construction, don't have anything. Shut everything down for Shut long. everything down. Okay. All right, yeah. All right, Nick, thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right, yep. Okay. There, there, there are people who are saying that you know if you're gonna do it, go all the way. Enough with the half measures. Um, John, are you there? Yes, I, I am. Yes, go ahead, sir. You're on the radio. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Rob, I, I'm worried about this AstraZeneca vaccine. Okay. I, I want to get the vaccine because I'm scared of the COVID. I'm going to be 70 years old, and this causes blood clots, and I'm on warfarin right now for blood clots. Oh, okay. So. This is what I'm really afraid of. Can we refuse the, the AstraZeneca? Uh, well, I be, you can refuse it, sure, sure. Yeah, Does it? I, I, you know, to... they can't force you to take anything you don't want to take, right? So. No, but I want to be able to get the Visine because I, I'm, I'm scared of getting the COVID. Yeah, I understand that, sir. I understand that. You can, you, you know, let's say you had an appointment and they said, it, it, you know, John, the only one we have is AstraZeneca. Sure, you can say no. Uh, it, I, it's no guarantee. I would suspect you're going to get one of the other vaccines. No, because right. they said before that it was no good for the people That's over what they said. 65, and That's now, right. they're saying, now they're saying 55 and below. That's so right. what do we believe? Isn't that it? Isn't that the problem right there? Where's for the sure. consistency? Right, but I understand your fear, sir. I understand right. your fear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, sorry. I think uh, we're moving along here. I think that's the signal from David. We got to move along. Oh, we'll take Marie's call on the West End, though, very quickly. One minute or less, Marie. Hi, Robin. Happy Hi. Easter to you. Thank Before you. Before I forget. Yeah. Um, yeah, you had a lot of great callers this morning, and the one there uh, said, you know, we should have done this a while back. I'm just looking at the, the TV right now. Like, there's 2,333 today, and, and ICU admissions are increasing daily. And I think it's really even worse than when it first started. It seems to be getting whatever. The, the politicians are in a very, very delicate position, you know. But I don't believe one word that comes out of Trudeau's mouth. I, I'm sorry that offends people out there, but it's all about vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. And he's using it as a crutch for, for an election. And um, it's and, and Doug Ford, he's... he's uh, why in the heck would you wait until the day before, you know, the really start of the Easter weekend to, to close us down? This should have been done when he saw it going up and up and up, which it has been. So it's, and you know my politics, and, yep. and uh, you know, but that shouldn't even come into play, to be honest with you. Lives are at stake here. And uh, just also to let you know, because I know you might have one or two more there, I'm getting my shot next Wednesday, and I kind of feel like you're just your previous caller there. I am kind of afraid of that one that I can't pronounce. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But right. what do you do? What do you, you know? do? Okay. You know? All right, Marie, i got to run. Thank okay, you. Dear, okay, no we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, the news is uh, coming up, and then it's Valley View with Bruce McIntyre from the Eganville Leader, the latest from Up the Line. This is City News.
This is City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, March 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 13 degrees. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Another day, well over 2,000 cases of COVID-19 in Ontario. 2,333. Of that number, 124 in Ottawa, 6 in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark, 20 in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. There are no new cases today in Renfrew. Results come from just over 52,500 tests. Toronto, again, going forward, 785 of these new cases are in the Toronto Health Unit. The province says 15 more people have also died from COVID. An infectious disease expert feels we are headed for another lockdown. The Premier apparently making an announcement tomorrow of some description with rising COVID case numbers. Dr. Suman Chakrabarty with the Trillium Health uh, System in Mississauga tells the Rob Snow Show he's not sure a lockdown is going to be that effective. A lot of transmission is happening in, in places that are not affected by lockdown. Homeless shelters, jails, a congregate living setting, congregate work sure. settings. And I think that's really important for people to, to recognize. And this is not something you hear a lot in the conversation about uh, transmission. Now, on the subject of people choosing one vaccine over another, he says it is worth the risk to take the AstraZeneca shot, even with the tiny risk of blood clots compared to the public health emergency we're facing. Federal and provincial governments set to announce a big investment in a new vaccine facility. We get the latest from City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. The new vaccine facility is being built in Toronto, and sources say the federal government will invest $415 million in a partnership with French pharmaceutical company. Sanofi Pasteur. Ontario's government will contribute $55 million to the project. While this new facility will be mainly focused on producing influenza vaccines, it will have the tools to fill and finish other vaccines on a mass scale. Sanofi will invest more than $455 million and create and maintain 1,200 highly skilled jobs. The company will also invest $79 million a year to fund Canadian research and development. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, it became clear Canada lacked the vaccine production capacity capacity to, to develop our own COVID vaccine quick enough, and that lack of capacity also prevented drug makers from signing deals to produce their shots here in our country. The Trudeau government has promised to make investments to change that for the future. Cormac McSweeney, Parliament Hill. And again, that plan is a go-ahead with $415 million from the federal government and the government of Ontario chipping in another $55 million. City News Time 1104. Traffic note this hour. Lanark OPP on scene of a gas leak on Bridge Street in Carleton Place. Detours in place. You're asked to find an alternate route. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. A gusty wind out of the southwest and then more of a northwest wind. Falling temperatures today with the periods of light rain. 14 early this morning will drop to minus 1 for the low. It'll feel colder with the wind. At rain, it'll change to snow tonight and some snow tomorrow morning. A couple of centimeters possible, the high near 1. For today, already reached the high, 14. And right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 13 degrees. Ridership continues to inch its way higher on OC Transbo in January. The system was running at 18% of normal volume. As of the middle of March, our ridership across the complete system is currently at 27% of where it would normally be. The transit agency's Pat Scrimgeour tells the Transit Commission levels on the buses are at 33%. Light rail is right now at 18%. I'm Andrew Boyle. For News Anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's time for Valley Views. Bruce McIntyre is right here from the Eganville Leader. Morning. Good morning, Rob. Yeah, on a very dreary dark wednesday morning i'm well yes, i'm yeah, well yeah no it's good to hear from you uh bruce i i just before we get into the the valley news of the week and what some of the stories that you have been uh covering for the eganville leader 
Uh, Doug Ford is at this news conference where they're announcing the uh, cost-sharing agreement for this vaccine production facility for uh, Toronto, $925 million in total. And uh, he was asked, because there are all kinds of rumors and uh, about a lockdown, I mean, is there going to be a lockdown? And the Premier said moments ago, we have the clip here. Go ahead. Uh, How do you explain to Ontarians why the province is continuing to loosen restrictions at this time? And, and stay tuned. Uh, you'll, you'll hear an announcement tomorrow. But I, I, uh, I'm very, very concerned to see the cases go up. I'm very concerned to see the ICU uh, capacity, and we all have to be vigilant. And- okay. Well, sounds like lockdown announcement tomorrow. That's going to be the news tomorrow. We bring the hammer down tomorrow, Bruce. I guess. Yeah. That's what I said in my email to David a little yeah. while ago. I said, let's, let's get, it's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, here in Renfrew County, we get a gold medal, Rob. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. What's, what, is the, uh, what is the situation there, anyway? Well, it's, it is zero count today, which is very encouraging. Um, we hope we can keep that pattern going. Yep. And in the town of Renfrew, we have something going on that's unique. Um, we had, your listeners might have heard, that our, both our Tim Horton locations closed uh, earlier this week voluntarily and by the corporate. Uh, one of the employees tested positive. So we have two locations on the highways coming into the highway uh, from this town, and both were closed. Mm. And kind of, a, kind of a domino effect. We had a restaurant uh, downtown voluntarily closed. We had a uh, variety store voluntarily closed. The owner said, you know what? It's not worth it. Um, we want to put our customers first. Uh, so some of the businesses in town are kind of taking it, but the bull by the horns, you know what? Our, our customers are more important than our, our commerce right now, and we're, we're shutting it down. And it's uh, something that's happened around Renfrew. It's kind of it's, it's encouraging, but it's um, disturbing. It's just that they're going to this length. Uh, you wouldn't think that would that'd be something voluntarily, but they are, which is different. Right, right, um, okay. And uh, Dr. Cushman, you know, he said uh, if there was a gold medal given out, the Renfrew County would get one uh, because of the numbers we have being so low and the number of vaccines being so high as far as percentages go of uh, uh, seniors coming out to get their uh, vaccinations. So it's, um, it's very encouraging that way. Um, we've been historically low since this pandemic began last March. Uh, we've had a couple um, um, spikes along the way, similar to the rest of the country, but for the most part, we're hanging pretty pretty low, which is encouraging, and people are um, respecting the rules. They really are. Okay. Well, I'm okay. Intri- I'm intrigued by this, Bruce, that uh, both Tim Hortons in Renfrew closed. Yeah. So where do you get a coffee if the Tim Hortons is closed in Renfrew? <laughs> McDonald's. We have <laughs> oh McDonald's. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. We have a uh, we have a page on Facebook called Promote Renfrew, and one person said, "How about a shout out to McDonald's? Have you seen the lineup lately?" It's I can just, only uh, imagine. My they God. They are lined out oh. the door, and the staff are running around, and they're and you know, how about a shout out to the employees at McDonald's for you know picking up the slack? Um, right. It, it, it's a blessing that the hockey season, what, what there was, is pretty much over because the hockey moms and dads be pretty cranky with their Tim Hortons in their hands. That's, oh, I can't so. imagine that, you know, without that, like, morning fix. Yeah. Right? Okay. I bet you the Tim Hortons are probably pretty busy in Renfrew. I'm just <laughs> guessing, right? They Usually, are. Right? They, they, yeah. had to, they had to redesign the O'Brien Road entrance for the Tim Hortons because it was backing up, causing traffic jams on right. the main artery. And that's kind of like the main drag, isn't it? It is, uh, it is the main right? drag. Yeah. You come in, it's it's, 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 it's right so. there, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Because if it's one, if it's one thing Tim Hortons has nailed, it's but we you know, where to put the Tim Hortons with the drive-through on the main drag in small town Canada. So, oh yeah, well we 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 got pretty advanced here, Rob. We went to the double lanes just recently. Oh, uh, we were single oh. we were single lanes and we got in double right. lanes. So okay. we're we're stepping up. We're stepping up. <laughs> so are they still closed? Or are they back open yes, they now? Are. I went just went by now uh, oh. about twenty about a half hour ago. I took a camera, got a picture, and uh, yeah, they are still shut down. Still shut down. Holy cow. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I know I the employees. I'm uh, from what I understand, the owners. Both owners are uh, sorry. One owner is very invested in the community. Right. Um, and he is uh, helping to compensate the employees that are that are um, oh, not working right now. They'll yeah. still be applying for serve or anything else, but he's uh, yeah. helping them out that way as well. So yeah. he's very community activated, uh, yeah. activist. Very yeah. very. Involved. A lot of the in, in most of the local franchise owners. That's the way they are. They're very yeah. strong-minded community people, right? So, they are. okay, well, um, but it is interesting uh, the way they they voluntarily just they don't wait for 
like an order to lock down. They just close up shops. So yeah, they shut it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how's the vaccine situation in Renfrew County these days? It is when we get it, we give it out. True. I shouldn't say True. we, the paramedics and the, and the and the healthcare workers, but like everybody else, we're waiting um, for our uh, for our next batch. And all we, I know there's people are not hesitant around here. Uh, from what I've talked to people and heard, mm-hmm. there's even though the bad press coming out about the one vaccine, people I don't care. I'm getting, I'm getting it. So that's the that's the sentiment around across the valley. From what I've heard, there are some pockets that are be resistant, which is common. But for the most part, people are ready to go. So you had I know a big. I'm, Sorry, Bruce. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You had a big parade. We did. 121 uh, vehicles. Gene parade. Kind of, uh, tender age of 101. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. in this time, people are showing their true generosity. They really are. They're showing, they're stepping up and doing things out of the ordinary. And I mean, it's a, it was a miserable day. It was dark like it is today. But you know what? 121 vehicles came out, and this woman was just thrilled to, to pieces. She, uh, I mean, that's the birthday she'll never forget. Hopefully she's with us for 100, 101 years. But, um, you know, the family was there and the friends and relatives. Just It was just a wonderful thing to see. And um, this week, this week, I think uh, the editor, Gerald Tracy, went to try to make it a little more light. Uh, it's, been, it's been dark for the last year. Who's kidding who? And our, our edition this week in The Leader is all about good news. I mean, we have some bad news in there as well, but it's, it's kind of a good news thing, and this definitely is, falls in the good news category. Yeah, absolutely. You know, she has 23 yeah. grandkids. 101 years old. My goodness yeah. gracious. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. And, it's, and uh, she's read, she the picture we have, she's a very smiley woman. <laughs> so, yeah. so if I'm in sense. your area, I understand uh, at this time of year, Easter Bunny time of year, it's, um, uh, you got to go to J and J's chocolate is that right? J and J, that's right. It's uh, down um, down on the strip. Uh, Judy uh, runs it now. Her husband passed away. You know what, Rob? If you think of a chocolatier, her late husband was it. He was about my height, about five five, chubby, always smiling, big round, happy cheeks. And he passed away about ten years ago. He just opened the shop about a year. Uh, Mr. Jake, very nice gentleman, uh, passed away. Had a heart attack, cutting the lawn, unfortunately. And um, the, the, the business has gone on. They're doing curbside. Um, Judy has uh, had a bowel cancer a couple, a few years back, so they are strictly curbside pickup. But it's very popular. I go by there every day when I walk the dog, and uh, you look in the window. It's like all oh, those chocolates, and it's just. Uh, they take great pride. It's a family business. The two daughters are involved with the, with the business along with Judy. And um, it's one of the staples. When people come to rent for the tours, that's one of the things they mark on there. Our little uh, check mark is J&J's Chocolate Sensations and the Bonisher Bakery just up the street. All these little local shops that are that are struggling, but they're they're, ma- they're making a goal of it during the pandemic. So get your get your chocolate. I guess it's too late now to get your chocolate orders in, but you can always try. They're open right, tomorrow. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it's been a long time since we've talked about uh, what uh, we used to kind of call the problem child of the of the Valley <laughs> municipalities, uh, North so. Algona Wilberforce, right? Yeah, the, I'm uh, say, yeah, I'm saying that right. The NA, the NA, ah, North yeah. Algona, NAW, North Algona Wilberforce. What's the latest uh, news out of there? Well, it's been very productive. They have a good uh, uh, council that works well together, and what they're looking at now is. A uh, letter of intent has been signed to take over the snow drifters snow, uh, property. What that is, and your listeners aren't aware of, we have Canada as one of the largest snowmobile races in all of, actually all of North America. We can, can we get competitors from across the country, and the United States come up for the uh, February Classic, the Bonnershire Cup. Didn't take place this year, uh, understandably, but it has. It, it's going on almost 50 years now, Rob, and it, you know, it's running into financial problems. It's hard to get the volunteers out. It's hard to, you know, uh, to keep make a goal of it. So the NAW Township is in talks with the snow drifters taking over the property. It's a big chunk of land, and that way the Bonisher Cup uh, races will continue. And we can only hope that it uh, it is successful next year because I'm, I'm not being a pessimistic, Rob. I'm not being uh, a cynic. Mm-hmm. But sometimes when the local governments get involved, you know, they, they it's not as good as it was. or it's lucky, But I think NEW is very, very committed to this, to making this a go. Because this is the signature tourist attraction in the wintertime for the area. 
Uh, we get a lot of people coming in to watch snowmobile races. It's very loud. I'll tell you, I've gone to a few myself. It's very cold. But it is a real family uh, affair. They have the uh, children's races. That you have kids four and five years old out there racing snowmobiles. It's kind of you hold your breath for a while, but <laughs> it is, it's wonderful to see. It's, a real, it's generational. You'll see generations of, you know, last year we had a woman from Quebec, Trois Rivières, come in, and her father, uh, sorry, her grandfather was a 1968 champion, and he established uh, Canadian snowmobiling. He was part of a very formidable team back in the 60s and 70s and she her grandfather taught her how to swim real and now she's a champion the grand champion of north america so mm. a lot of them get yes, there i uh, remember they, the yeah i remember yeah. The, that story yeah yeah so uh, good news for nadw they're being very proactive they recognize the value in um the property and as well the value of the tourist attraction so that's something that uh we'll be developing over the next year okay excellent so great to get the uh, update from eganville from you today hope all's well, well. All is well, and to all your listeners, wish them a happy Easter. And if Absolutely, you're yeah. bored, come for a walk downtown Renfrew, take a look, or Pembroke or Killoo, come on yeah. in. Don't be don't be strangers. Yeah. But and just remember, uh, Tim Hortons is closed. That's right, and wear, and wear your mask. <laughs> <laughs> wear your mask. Thank you, Bruce McIntyre. Talk yeah. soon. Uh, with Valley View from the Eganville Leader, he's uh, also doing some work for us here at City News in Ottawa. That's Bruce McIntyre. We will be right back talking baseball. Blue Jays season opener tomorrow. And City News here in Ottawa is your home for Blue Jays baseball on the radio. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. It's such a beautiful feel because it's all natural. Um, I'm able to talk to a lot of people who are going through different uh, journeys of health where they really don't know where to start, where to begin. And I'm happy and grateful to have all this knowledge where I can actually help them and guide them. So, um, of course, you know, medications have a great place in our system, but even so do natural therapies, which have been around for centuries and centuries. Like, you know, uh, old time, ancient times, everything herbs grew, everything was done with nature, all healing was done with nature, so I'm totally in love with all the elements with nature. In our beautiful village of Manatic, the Manatic Natural Market, you can find tremendous different things. So we have herbs, we have vitamins, uh, we have natural uh, body care, uh, we do infrared sauna therapy, uh, nutrition counseling, acupuncture, bowen therapy, energy healing, so we're like a wellness hub. Uh, along with being a full health food store. We are one year into pandemic since it started last year in March. Um, it was a shock, usually I see things coming and I definitely did not see that coming. Golden Root is a product that I created uh, four years ago, actually for my kids, uh, just for immune system, overall health, and it just took off with certain friends of mine who had cancer or some severe issues and they started finding that it was really helping them uh, from um, different um, tests they had done with their doctor and I knew I had something really special so then I went through the proper uh, procedure of being able to sell it so it's actually I'm not allowed to make it anymore in my house four years ago and it is made in a Health uh, Canada approved lab and then it comes to me and what Golden Root is is a formulation of turmeric, ginger, lavender, oregano and black pepper all food grade which is the most bioavailable turmeric in the market right now for pain, inflammation, digestion, immune system, concussion, liver health and brain health so uh, and it tastes like salad dressing. We do a lot of in-house, so we make our in-house uh, concoctions of teas. Uh, you can come here, tell us what your health issues are, and we can blend it right there. And there's some that are already prepared beforehand for sleeping, for anxiety, for different things. And in that bar, we basically make cold brew teas and cold brew nitrogen coffee. And again, it's uh, all local. Everything we do is local, and as many herbs we can find uh, locally as well. If a client can come out, We'll go out our way to deliver it. Uh, and you're getting that personal touch when you come in. If you have an issue, we will listen and help you. We're very, very active in the community, so we would like the same thing back for the community to come to. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Tomorrow, 
is opening day for the Toronto Blue Jays. First game against the New York Yankees. So let's talk baseball with Jeff Blair, host of Baseball Central on Sportsnet 590. Good morning, Jeff. Hey, Rob. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Are the Blue Jays going to be any good this season? Define any. <laughs> um, well, a lot of know, changes, right? A lot of changes, but some big name signings. So, uh, yeah, no. Listen, I think that that if you look at the Jays right now, you would probably say they're the third best team in the American League East, and I don't think that's going to be good enough to make the playoffs this year. Um, but there's a couple of caveats. First of all, the New York Yankees, who you know everybody is in love with again, it's been that way for 30 years, and they haven't won every one of those years. But, uh, I mean, there are a couple of positive things before you look at the Blue Jays, if you're a Blue Jays fan. The Yankees are relying on a couple of pitchers who are coming off pretty serious injuries. And if you look at – if you take a look at how the rotations are set up this year in Major League Baseball. I mean, baseball's dealing with, obviously, a different season than last year. But at the end of the day, every team has got to figure out a way to fill 900 extra innings because the difference between a 60-game regular season and 162 is about 900 innings. Okay. So the, the Yankees have in Jamison Tyon and Corey Kluber, two guys who three years ago, if they were in the Yankees, said there wouldn't even be any sense of playing the season this year. The Yankees would win. They're both coming off injuries. Tyon is already a little farther behind than the Yankees thought he was going to be. They are relying on Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stan, neither of whom have ever been able to stay healthy. I mean, I think the Yankees have more issues than a lot of people think they do. Their bullpen to start out the year is going to be thin. That brings us to Tampa Bay, and of course, there's no point in talking about Tampa Bay because we know that whatever we think about Tampa Bay, they're going to figure something out about six weeks into the season and be one of the best teams in baseball. That's their MO. That's how they work. So I look at the Blue Jays, comparing them to the other teams in the American League East, and much like the Yankees, the Jays have a lot of questions with their starting pitching. Okay. Yunjin Ryu is fine as an opening day starter. But after that, Rob, I mean, they've got a bunch of guys who on a really good team at best would be, at best would be a fifth starter. Steven mm-hmm. Matz, Robbie Ray. Uh, these guys are reclamation projects, much like the Yankees guys are reclamation projects. And the other thing that, that we noticed in spring training, and I don't think people – have kind of wrapped their heads around this yet. George Springer and Marcus Semien are huge acquisitions. There's no doubt about it. But if you look at the Blue Jays infield right now, you've got Kevin Biggio, who's never played a season at third base at third base. You've got Marcus Semien, who's a shortstop at second. You've got Bo Bichette at short, great offensive player, not had a great spring defensively. And at first base, in a lot of games, you're going to have Vladimir Guerrero Jr., right. who is still learning that position. So you couple the fact that you've got... A, an unproven infield with pitchers who aren't going to strike out a lot of hitters. The ball is going to be in play a great deal for the Toronto Blue Jays. And, and I think there's a possibility that that could be a pretty toxic, a pretty toxic, toxic miss. To me, to, to me, the key is going to be where the Blue Jays are about six weeks into the season. If they're hanging in, then I think you're going to see this front office pull the trigger on a pretty significant trade for a pitcher. And, and oh, that, to me, is okay. that, that's going to determine the Blue Jays' fate this year. They absolutely have to have another really good starting pitcher. They have to find it someplace. Well, what signal was sent with the addition of George Springer to the Toronto Blue Jays? Just how you big know, was that? I mean, it, it, it was big in that he was, you know, obviously he's, he's one of the premier postseason players of this time. You know, let's keep in mind, though, that in order to sign George Springer, the Blue Jays had to give him at least one more year more than every other team that was talking to him, and probably about 20 to $25 million more than other teams. So I don't know how much of a – I mean, it's significant to the fan base because you are, you are adding the biggest name free agent, you know, you've brought in in, in a long time. Yeah. Uh, it's a significant signal, I think, from ownership because the Blue Jays didn't have any ticket revenue last year. They're probably not going to play any games in front of crowds in Toronto this year. The Blue Jays have a lot of expenses. They don't have as much revenue as other teams in terms of ticket sales. Yet here is ownership throwing out this huge contract. So I think it's a significant message to the fan base. 
I think it's it's been received positively in the clubhouse because George Springer's considered a good guy and a good player and all that. But at the end of the day, and, and he has improved, there's no doubt he's improved the team's outfield defense. They have nobody who can play center field in this team. So he's improved the team's outfield defense. He's a great hitter, but is he the guy that takes them from third place to first? I don't think so. That That is, as is always the case, that is going to come down to the pitcher. Okay. So just um, maybe a few comments, uh, some insight on just how this baseball season is going to work. They're not doing a bubble thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't do a bubble thing last year either, right? You know, every team yeah, goes to... In, yeah, just in the postseason. Just in the they postseason. Had, they had a modified okay. bubble. Right. Okay. Fan, are there going to be, for example, this is um, in New York tomorrow, right? This game, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. Are there going to be fans or? Oh, there'll be, there'll be, a, there'll be ten. I think they're selling ten thousand tickets. Fans okay. are going to have to have temperature checks. Hmm. Uh, you are not going to have to present a vaccine certificate, obviously. But you know, when the Jays go to Texas for the second game of the series, I mean, there'll be however many people want to be there. Texas is an open state. Oh yeah, Stadiums it's wide are, open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stadiums are fully open. I don't even know in Texas if there's. I, I think there's probably going to be some social distancing guidelines in place but I, I honestly don't know the only team i'll tell you this the only team that is not going to have fans in the stands by the end of this month is the blue jays I and mean, even milwaukee's talking about 25 percent we've seen teams that originally said 10 percent they've bumped up to 25 percent even before games are played so as the vaccine gets rolled out in the states you know i think by the summer we're you know in in, in most cities it's going to be business business as usual well, but not for Toronto, though. Not I don't for think Toronto. there's a. Yeah. I don't. I don't think there's a chance we'll have baseball in front of fans in Toronto this year. Best case scenario, and I know the Blue Jays are thinking this. Best case scenario is maybe the middle of July. They're playing games at the Rogers Center, you know, in front of an empty, uh, in an empty Rogers Center. But the Jays have been very clear that even if they go to Buffalo, and the plan right now is to play in Dunedin until the end of June then go to Buffalo. If they go to Buffalo, let's say if they have to go to Buffalo for three weeks even, the Jays have been very clear that even though they will be able to have fans in Buffalo, you know, you, the Jays will probably be able to have eight to 10,000 fans in Buffalo, they will go to Toronto the second they have the opportunity, even if there's no fans in the stand. Oh, okay. They will make okay. the move up to Toronto. All right. Well, Jeff Blair, enjoy another season of Blue Jays baseball. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. Should be a lot of fun. Yep. The host of Baseball Central, Sportsnet 590 in Toronto, and of course, City News Ottawa, all your Toronto Blue Jays action found right here, 1310 AM, 101.1 FM. Uh, 105, first pitch tomorrow. 1128 news coming up here on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Wednesday, the 31st of March. Good morning, I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa, we've got cloudy skies, some light rain, 13 degrees, little windy as well. In Smith Falls, we've got some clouds, light rain, and 12 degrees. Here's what's making news this hour. Stay tuned, Premier Doug Ford, on a question about restrictions in the province with COVID-19 cases continuing to rise. It says an announcement will be coming tomorrow on the possibility of a province-wide lockdown in response to the spread of novel coronavirus and the rise of variants of concern. Ford meets with his cabinet today to discuss the modeling data on the pandemic. Yesterday, the premier said he wouldn't hesitate to pull the so-called emergency break in response to rising case counts and increased hospitalizations. Provincial health officials reporting 2,333 new cases of COVID-19 and 15 deaths at seven straight days with case counts above 2,000 and today's numbers out of over 52,000 tests. Public Health Ontario reporting 124 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa. Yesterday, the health unit confirmed 112. Elsewhere locally, 20 new cases in eastern Ontario. Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit reports three new cases, two in the last 24 hours. There are no new cases in Renfrew County. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario has suspended the medical license of a doctor accused in the murder of an 89-year-old Quebec man at a hospital in Hawkesbury last week. Police charged Dr. Brian Nadler with first-degree murder in the death of Albert Poindinger of Point Claire last Friday. Poindinger died at Hawkesbury and District General Hospital the day before the doctor was arrested. Nadler's case returns to court next week. I'm Sarah Buckin. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. The head of the University of Ottawa Heart Institute is calling for all patient facing healthcare workers to receive second doses of COVID 19 vaccine without delay. That is a front page story from Elizabeth Payne in the Ottawa Citizen this morning, and we are following up here this morning here on City News on the Rob Snow Show with an interview. And uh, we are glad to be joined by the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Heart Institute, Dr. Thierry Misana. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. It's very nice to hear from you. Uh, this call for healthcare workers at your facility to receive second doses of COVID-19 vaccine without delay, why are you making that plea, sir? Well, number one, this call is not just for the Heart Institute staff. I mean, uh, I went out to alert the public in general of the situation of the hospitals. And uh, I believe this is not just the Heart Institute, which is in this situation where you have uh, patient facing uh, healthcare workers having only one dose of vaccination and the second dose being delayed up to June. Although we have evidence that the second dose inc- uh, improve uh, pr- protection. Well, I was just hearing your news and you were saying how bad is the situation in the hospitals. I think it's going to be even worse in the ICUs. We just need a maximum healthcare work, uh, workforce for now and uh, for the next couple of months with a variant uh, we're going to have uh, to face very difficult situations and we cannot afford to have uh, so many healthcare workers exposed and one dose give goose protection for community and for healthcare workers probably 80 percent but second dose when it's delivered on time and not off label not after four four months but like five weeks then you have the 95 percent protection that you need for healthcare workers to take care of the population and this is really the challenge that we have we should have a different way to see healthcare workers taking care of the entire population for cardiac or cancer or covid covid or non-covid and uh, then the rest of the community we have to vaccinate the community but we shouldn't have the same same reasoning for the people working in hospitals who are actually taking care of the people who are sick. And again, your appeal is not just for the Heart Institute, but no. for uh, healthcare institutions uh, across the strata, right? Uh, in Canada, all in together, Canada. the sure. entire yeah. country. I mean, uh, I'm not, you know, yes, of course, we, we don't have, a, a, we have a, a problem here. We can actually f- provide cardiac care to patients, but I'm, I'm worried that if we, this become out of control, when you have 10 or 12 nurses with COVID positive testing in a place like us, 
or in another hospital. You have a lot more staff out of work because they have been, you have the contact tracing, you have to keep people home until you are sure they are not COVID positive as well. You have to test the entire, the entire uh, ward. It's, it's a lot of stress on the staff. And you know what? Don't forget, we have been in this for one year, okay? This is the time where we need to support our staff and the healthcare workers and show them we do everything we can to protect them. You don't send soldiers to war without proper equipment. So when, when we have our, these people in hospitals, they save people's life. You know, they go to, to the hospital to work to save other people's life. You need to make sure they have the maximum protection. And if a second dose gives you 10, 15 percent more, give them the second dose. You call it uh, off-label, this decision it's to... Off, yeah, it's okay. Canada decided to off-label Pfizer. You don't sound and, impressed with that, doctor. You don't sound I impressed. Am not. I, I, I mean, it's, it's a gamble. It may be okay to get 80% uh, uh, vaccination, 80% uh, success of vaccination uh, to get herd, herd immunity. But in a hospital, you know how difficult can be the situation in Canadian hospitals. Mm -hmm. Canadian hospitals are always at some point short of beds, short of staff. We have currently a, a, probably a thousand uh, a position in healthcare workers that are not not uh, not filled because nobody wants to 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 get confronted to this situation. So I think we have to protect more of staff in the hospitals because protecting the hospitals is protecting the population. This is what people don't understand. I mean, the public uh, public health officials, they make great decisions to vaccinate the, 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 the population. It's very important to vaccinate the, the more uh, vulnerable people like we did. It's great, great decisions, great strategy. Unfortunately, we don't have enough doses. That's the problem. But we have to be careful with the hospitals because the hospitals need to go full capacity in the next two months because we have a, a wave three, which is even different than the other waves. And the last thing I want to say is that we have to be smarter than the virus. OK, the virus is always one step ahead of us. One step. Same thing for masks a year ago, then for testing a few months ago, now for vaccination. The vaccination, the virus is outracing us if we don't take this kind of measures. Okay, let me ask you this. Uh, you're calling this for patient facing healthcare yes. workers. Um, Absolutely. Give me a sense of how many of those employees do you have at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute? So, very simple, I have about 1,500 employees, okay? Yeah. We have all the patient-facing staff, which is close to 1,000, okay. had one, one dose at least, 35% had two doses, and I still have 500 staff at the Heart Institute that most of them can work from home because they are in the administration or in research, but not clinical research. So those have not even received one dose. So I have currently 500 staff that have not received even one dose. The patient facing have received one or two doses, 35% only had two doses, but I understand that. Right. Now I may be in a situation where on the ward, you can have a patient COVID positive and one nurse taking care of this patient with one dose and another nurse with two doses. How, how fair this is to the staff. Right. And so you would have about 650 people working there, patient-facing healthcare workers who have had just one dose. Uh, uh, roughly, have, around 650 yeah. or so. Yes. Yeah, uh, and and when, were they, when did they get the first dose? So we started the, so the first dose, I mean, we January. started vaccination, yeah, January, and then uh, in the middle of the road, they say, well, now we cannot do the second dose before, before, uh, mm -hmm. before uh, four months. So basically, the people who got the first dose after that were told, well, now you have to wait four months. But those people work in the same areas. Okay. So I mean, if, if, if again, uh, please, let, let, let's say your pleas fall on deaf ears, doctor. And say, well, you know, sure, we'd like to do that for, for you and all the patient-facing healthcare workers, but we can't, there's just not enough supply, and this is the decision, and we're sticking with it. When would most, when would those 650 people, most of them would get their second dose? When would that happen? We, we actually need 
we actually need for patient facing we actually need about 400 doses to get everybody get two doses patient facing but again i don't want this to make a heart institute story we have a the heart issue story is not only the heart issue story. Right. I think every hospital is in the same problem. Okay. And we are having these discussions with other CEOs where we are, we may have beds, but we may not have staff to take care of the patients in these beds. And this is what is so important. And I want to tell again that the staff, the, the, the healthcare workers have been in this fight for one year. And I don't think it's the right message to tell them, well, you can be treated like the rest of the population and have the second dose in four months, when they know they will have COVID, to face COVID patient, positive uh, patients. And, and the people who have not had the second dose, they just have to be cautious for a few weeks before to get exposed. But the healthcare workers has no option. You have to come to work and take care of these patients. So to me, you have, you have a duty to our staff to protect them as much as you can. And if two doses give you 10, 15% more protection, that's what we should be doing for our staff. You know, it's always good to, to, to give a lot of kudos and credits to the healthcare workers, but you know, it's, you have more just to say it. We have just more to praise them. You have to do something for these guys. And this is what I want to raise awareness on the community. And I don't think the community knows all of that. And I think the community would be very pleased to find out that finally the healthcare workers, patient facing, have all two doses because they want to be access to the hospitals. Sure. And it will give the patients peace of mind as well to know that there's that whoever is taking care of them is fully vaccinated and fully protected. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, All Doctor, right. I, I thank you for your time this morning. It's My greatly pleasure. appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Uh, very powerful stuff there. That is uh, Dr. Thierry Asana, and he is the president and CEO of the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Wow, what a champion for his staff. 11.42. Uh, we're right back. There's a transit commission meeting happening right now. This is an emergency transit commission meeting. It's about root cuts to OC Transpo. It's uh, about possible job losses at OC Transpo. A number of delegates signed up to have their say before the transit commission. Sue Sharing of the Ottawa Sun has been following it all. And she's going to join me next here on City News. I'm blessed to be married to someone who is a scientist and spent a lot of time following what was happening over in China ahead of time. So he did give us the heads up that this was coming. Not that we believed him right off the bat, but uh, when it did happen very, very quickly, we were prepared. We had hand sanitizer and we were set up um, to not close our doors. So we locked the kitchen down at Wellington Street, but we left this kitchen open. We put in protocols immediately. Um, we were only we only allowed our very small crew of four or five people in at the time. Um, no deliveries were allowed to come in or out of the building without, um, well, they just weren't allowed in and out of the building. So we met them at the loading dock um, and had very strict protocols in place right away. We had masks and hand sanitizer and the whole, the whole thing. So we're very lucky from that perspective and we're able to, you know, learn as we went as far as doing small, uh, individually packed caterings the frozen soup program, um, food for the Ottawa mission. So um, we just didn't have, we didn't have to close the kitchen and then learn how to reopen it. We just were able to modify and shift as we needed to. Because of our partnership with the Ottawa mission, we were able to very quickly help support them. They were able to send us some product and some supplies. So it wasn't um, a burden on our um, business and we were able to supply the staffing and the packaging to help. Um, produce that when they needed it the most and we produced about 1400 meals a week to complement their meals and we started our soup program right away we realized very quickly that there was a need in the community to get together and all work together not only to support local but also just to support all the people that were suddenly in a position of you know being locked down and not being able to get out um, so by starting that soup program um, our community our clients got online and, and started making donations for the soups 
and we were able to produce the soups and get them back out to people that, that needed it. We're right now currently making 150 litres of soup per week, but we've made, I would say, five or 6,000, you know, easily since the pandemic, probably more. I'd have to do the math, um, but lots. I think everybody in the city has to be very aware of how blessed we were to have great weather this summer and people were able to get out and about, and that's going to shift. So we do have to be much more aware of who our most vulnerable is, and I really think we have to work together as groups. There are so many organizations in the city um, that are doing something and contributing and working together, and I think it doesn't matter who, but see what you can do to just step up and help them, whatever it is, whether it's driving or delivering food or you know, someone has extra zucchini in their garden or if they can afford to donate some money to any of these organizations. I just think we all have to work together. We're smarter and wiser than we were the first time. is changing so keep up with rob the rob snow show returns on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 am sue sharing will be along shortly city hall columnist read her every monday in the ottawa sun uh the transit commission is having uh, an emergency meeting this morning this is called because of uh, the possibility of root cuts and job losses at oc transpo service cuts at oc transpo in light of the plummeting ridership at oc transpo and uh, who do we have speaking right now here let's listen here it would be a great time for you to direct staff to do more than meet the minimum standard the minimum right. standard and that's why we called a special meeting miranda for today we didn't want to wait till the april one as soon as the report was ready i wanted it out there as did the members of the commission i think we all agree that the uh, special meeting was warranted to get this out to give the public a chance to to not only see it a week ahead but to come today and discuss Miranda, please. Uh, you also have, uh, and the public has up till uh, June when the changes kick in. There, there's discussions taking place with the individual councillors in the area, the routes that are affected, and so on. So there's, uh, and there's the OC Transpo. Uh, open lines of communication that people can uh, email in if they have uh, any specific concerns with this and That's things fair. will be looked at and addressed where possible okay you cut off multiple delegations today who wanted to talk to the broader issues by saying you can talk in april so don't tell us that we could have talked about it today when you cut people off you can have it one way or the other you told us we had to speak to specific routes today so we so did not talk about sure. general principles Correct. So we're not this talking is, about um, the, the general stuff. Councillor Kavanaugh has a question. A delegate uh, to the Transit Commission meeting. Uh, her name is Miranda Gray. A regular transit uh, user. Very active on Twitter. Uh, very active. In terms of the consultation, what do you see as the as uh, the right amount of time to reach out to to riders in terms of generally? Well, there's two types of consultation you need. I would suggest that you need standing stakeholder groups for each of your major districts so that you have a group of people beyond the councillors who actually are regular riders who have a track record of understanding the history to provide some feedback. When we're talking about groups like transit riders, ACORN, uh, the FCA, um, uh, the paratranspo group, uh, it's probably no less than two weeks because people are have busy schedules. Realistically, if you are doing a massive change, uh, talking about long-term principles, it's probably more than a month. So if you're setting a service performance standard that's going to kick in next December um, and talk about how we are restructuring because we know that uh, ridership levels are not going to return in less than three years, or we think it might take three to five years, that discussion needs to take months. If we are talking about uh, the plan to return to service in the fall on the belief that all the schools are open, we're probably talking two to three weeks. It's depending on how big a change you're putting in front of us. If we are talking specifics, it takes less time. If we are talking general principles, it's a long-term discussion that we're going to use for years and we should take significant time in discussing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Miranda, for coming out. Uh, that closes the uh, public delegations part of the, the meeting. And uh, now we're, uh, do any of the commissioners have questions for staff? Okay, Councillor Brockington. 
Thank you, Chair. I this represent the, uh, the city on an emergency uh, transit commission meeting that was called in light of uh, root cuts uh, and job cuts to OC Transpo. It's been a year of plummeted ridership at OC Transpo. Uh, learned today, still ridership down about seventy-seven percent. I do um, hear the uh, multiple requests to have better engagement on these changes, and I want to talk about that a bit. OC Transpo modifies routes on a quarterly basis all the time. And I just want to ask staff and maybe Mr. Scrimger can clarify that, that we do do these changes. We probably don't do the same scope of changes that are being proposed for June. If Mr. Scrimger could just comment on that. That's correct. Uh, four times a year, we have uh, uh, the opportunity to make schedule changes. Uh, they are sometimes uh, service improvements that uh, come from council investing more money in transit. They are sometimes seasonal changes, uh, such as when we uh, add service to the parks and remove service to the schools during the summer. Uh, we also respond at each of those quarterly um, uh, changes to uh, major increases in ridership that we're seeing on some routes or in some cases uh, reductions in ridership. Uh, it's also our opportunity to change schedules to improve reliability and we continue this we've uh, we've got changes coming up in april um, which as you know include um, uh, reliability improvements and getting ready for the montreal road construction and these are changes that will come in june along with these changes in june also come the seasonal changes um, with the uh, the school holidays I appreciate that. Probably in the future, if we know the number of changes proposed exceed a certain threshold, it may want to trigger an additional opportunity for consultations. If it's sort of the regular changes you do on a quarterly basis, which you have the delegated authority to do anyway, then I think that's different. But I think there was a point, number of points made today that I think we have to think further on. Just on the financial side, what was our 2020 deficit and what is the 2021 proposed deficit for transit? Chair, I don't know if finance staff are on. Okay, on uh, we were supposed to be joined by Sue Sharing. I hope she's okay. She's probably, you know, I bet you she has her phone on mute and she's watching the Transit Commission meeting right now because uh, she tweeted about how she couldn't wait to come on the Rob Snow Show today. Uh, she tweeted about that, <laughs> that about an hour ago. Now we can't get a hold of her. But I, I really do hope she's okay. And uh, sorry about that. It happens. It's live radio. These things happen. Uh, so we have to move away from that. That's the Transit Commission meeting underway uh, right now. Now, uh, this morning, the big news, of course, it remains the rising case counts, the situation in Ontario hospitals, the vaccination rollout. We have 421 people in ICUs. Uh, across Ontario now, when the uh, Ontario Hospital Association said we'd max out at 150, we're at 421 now. And just within the last hour, Premier Ford said uh, tomorrow, news on lockdowns tomorrow. So that'll be <laughs> a big story tomorrow. Now, this morning, I had a chance to speak to infectious disease specialist uh, from Mississauga, Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. And uh, I asked him about how much health professionals have learned about how to treat COVID-19 over the last year. We have a, you know, a couple of new treatments. In the second wave, we were able to start something called dexamethasone. It's a potent anti-inflammatory. As COVID tends to really um, rev up your immune system to a point that the immune system is actually damaging the body. So we need to calm that down a bit. And recently, we've been using a, a drug called tocilizumab as well. It's a, a, a rheumatic, uh, a rheumatoid arthritis type drug okay. that certain people can really help to calm that down. And I'm noticing people that used to for sure be on a ventilator within a, within a day or two are now not getting to that point so we have some things that have really really helped the situation right you still don't want to get it though right <laughs> I, I agree with you and this is why i think prevention is the best thing and that's why vaccination is so important and of course at the point that we are right now doing whatever we can to you know reduce our contacts uh uh you know uh, wearing masks while indoors and these types of things right okay why do you think at this point, uh, just about to hit April here in 2021, more younger people seem to be 
falling ill with COVID? What do you think is going on there, ending up in the hospital with COVID? Yeah, this is a, an important aspect. I think part of this is, I think that there's a, a thought that the way it's been presented is that because it's deadly to young people. And of course, we want to still avoid it. But part of the reason we're seeing this is because the COVID variants tend to be especially big in essential workplaces. These are places that are not closed in the lockdown. We need them. Grocery stores, factories, food processing plants. And we see that people can get more easily infected in these congregate environments and if you look at look at it the people that are most likely to work in these areas are aged 25 to uh, 59 and that's part of what we're seeing plus you've taken away a lot of the older individuals with long-term care being vaccinated we've right, barely right. seen any of uh, LTC being admitted so these are part of the reasons why we're seeing it in the younger group it's not necessarily that the virus is now targeting younger people Plus, as you say, I mean, you're in Mississauga, you're in Peel region, you're like in the land of the warehouse, right? Land of the distribution center, right? A lot of people working close together. You know, you're a hotspot. Have have been a hotspot for a long time. We have been. And, you know, if you look at uh, what's happened, even when things were getting better in the summertime uh, in uh, 2020, you know, we were still having grumbling cases going on. And we found what's called the what I call the occupational to household transmission chain. This is one of the biggest drivers of the pandemic, especially here in Peel, but all over Canada. And you'll see that this is part of the reason why I've been very critical of people constantly saying, stay home, stay home, stay home, because the people who are unfortunately being affected by the pandemic uh, disproportionately can't stay home and you know it's not parties that these young people are going to it's people that are essential workers and i think it's important for us to really recognize this this far into the pandemic and uh you know we have a lockdown likely coming up the lockdown is not going to do anything to help uh, uh this area this huge area of transmission hmm. lockdown likely coming up do you think we need another lockdown you know, I think that at this point, with the, with the cases going the way they are, I think uh, certainly a lockdown is uh, on the table. I suspect it's going to happen sometime this week based on uh, what uh, Premier Ford was saying. Yeah. But I think that people have, again, uh, lockdown is, let's just lock things down. It's going to make things better. And like I said, a lot of transmission is happening in, in places that are not affected by lockdown. Homeless shelters, jails, uh, congregate living settings, congregate work sure. settings. And I think that's really important for people to, to recognize. And this is not something you hear a lot in in the conversation about uh, transmission. My conversation from earlier this morning, Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. He is an infectious disease specialist at Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. That's it for the Rob Snow Show for today. We're back tomorrow, Thursday. And basically what we've done with Thursday's show, everything we would usually do on Friday because we don't have a show because it's Good Friday. So Lowell Green, Pierre Bork, Steve Warren, all on tomorrow's show. And we'll do a Thursday free for all. Be part of it, will you? The new news. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV.